Welcome everyone to the September 20th, 2022 City Commission meeting. Uh, to begin with, we'll have some explanation of how our meetings operate from Porter O'Neill. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I just have a few housekeeping items for the Zoom meeting portion tonight. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel and cable channel 25. Please remember to mute yourself during the meeting unless you are speaking. The chat function for this public meeting is disabled. All chats will go directly to me. Unless you are participating during the meeting, please turn your video off. This allows the active meeting participants to be seen on screen. You will still be able to hear the meeting. When you are participating in the meeting, please turn your video on. If you have any trouble, you can send me a chat. The city reserves the right to mute people or turn individual videos off to minimize distractions during the meeting. And now I'll turn the meeting back over to Mayor Shipley. Thank you. And now we'll have some explanation of how public comment operates from Sherry. Thank you, Mayor. When the mayor calls for public comment, individuals attending in person should approach the podium to indicate they wish to speak. The podium can be raised and lowered, and we encourage you to use this feature to ensure your comments are heard. Individuals participating via Zoom should use the raise hand function to indicate they wish to speak. Please leave your virtual hand raised until you are called on. Individuals will be called on in the order they appear on the meeting host screen. Please state your name before speaking and all comments will be limited to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. That brings us to the approval of the agenda. The City Commission reserves the right to amend, supplement, or reorder the agenda during the meeting. Uh, do I have any motions? Yeah, I'm, I would make a motion to defer item on the regular agenda, item number four, due to the absence of Commissioner Sellers, who is one of the uh, advocates of this program. And otherwise approve the agenda. Can I second? <laughs> I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, that next brings us to the recognition proclamations uh, for this week uh, to proclaim Saturday, October 2nd, 2022 as Lawrence Drive Electric Day. Is Teresa, oh, there she is. Commissioners, I'm a member of the Sustainability Action Network, which is a local incorporated nonprofit organization which formed in 2007 with a clear vision of how to use, of how the use of fossil fuel is at the root of the problems with climate disruption. We meet on a monthly basis and information about our meetings is contained in our weekly newsletter, which can be found at sustainabilityaction.net. Part of our mission is to bring awareness of the tools needed to reskill our economy in order to bring a more ecologically sustainable world. The Sustainability Action Network has helped to bring awareness to National Drive Electric Week for many years. The Lawrence City Commission began addressing a climate action plan at nearly the same time as Sustainability Action Network began. Most recently updated in 2012, our city's own greenhouse gas emission analysis determined that transportation is responsible for 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions and that those emissions have been steadily increasing. Our choice is to either switch from fossil fuels to conservation and renewable energy or face catastrophic climate incidents. This year, our electric car show will be in South Park on Sunday, October 2nd, 10 to 2. Thank you for reading our proclamation, and we hope to see everyone there to learn how electric cars are really cool and definitely a viable choice for all our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'll read that proclamation. Whereas petroleum fueled vehicles are responsible for over 50% of our local greenhouse gas emissions and are a contributing factor to air pollution and climate disruption, threatening the health of our citizens and the sustainability of our planet. 
And whereas the United States transportation sector has surpassed the electricity generation sector in climate heating emissions, and whereas plug-in electric vehicles use one-fifth the energy used by internal combustion vehicles and get 100 miles per gallon equivalent or better, and whereas plug-in electric vehicles produce no greenhouse gas emissions when charged with renewable energy and only one-fifth of the greenhouse gas emissions when charged with fossil fuels, and whereas September 23rd to October 2nd, 2022, has been designated as National Drive Electric Week throughout the United States to educate our citizens about the benefits benefits of plug-in electric vehicles and to promote their adaptation. Now, therefore, I, Courtney Shipley, Mayor of the City of Lawrence, Kansas, do hereby proclaim Saturday, October 2nd, 2022, as Lawrence Drive Electric Day, and encourage all citizens to attend the Lawrence Electric Vehicle Showcase at South Park between 10 and 2. Thank you, Teresa. That brings us to our consent agenda. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered under one motion and will be approved by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on those items. If discussion is desired, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Members of the public wishing to speak to an item that's been pulled off the consent agenda will be limited to three minutes for comments. Are there any items that uh, members of the commission would like to remove? Commissioner Littlejohn? None. Okay, are there any items that a member of the audience would like to remove? We have two Anything else that anyone in the room would like to remove? C1. Anything else in the room on the consent agenda? Hold on, let me look. <laughs> oh no, that's a regular agenda item. We'll get to it. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone online who would like to remove something from the consent agenda? Raise your digital hand. Uh, there's no one online that wants to pull an item. All right, thank you. Uh, commissioners, do I have a motion? Yes, I move to approve the consent agenda with the exception, exception of the following items, C6B and C1A. Second. I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes four to zero. Um, that brings us to C1A. Um, okay. Oh. Thank you. Jeremy roth Gushell, Lawrence, Kansas, the radical middle of America. Um, Thank you, Mayor, uh, Commissioners, City Staff. Uh, I, once again, I'm going to bring up the issue of the fact that we don't have text searchable minutes in relationship to a full and complete official city record of what actually goes on and what is meant to be a deliberative democratic process. Mayor, you said in the audience, audience comes from Latin to listen. That's partially why we're here, but we're also here to engage, to deliberate, to provide input. That's part of the deliberative function. So in general, we're continuing to see a wide scope uh, attempt, it looks like, to continue eviscerating the basic uh, cooperative public intelligence function of our deliberative democratic uh, system, both in terms of the limitations as it looks like it's going in relationship to uh, public general comment, how it seems to be heading towards being siphoned off, but this continuing problem of the fact that we do not have credible, legitimate, uh, extensive minutes. Now, we used to have some press in this city that would actually cover public comment around serious controversies, including the controversy around the nepotistic deal that the city's legal department actually allowed the city commission to uh, enter into in relationship to the Rock Chalk Park, the now uh, federal felon developer, and the relationship with his family inside of the uh, KU endowment and all of that. The record of my comments from almost 10 years ago are now searchable on the web showing that there were uh, people in the Lawrence public who were, along with parts of the journalistic community at that point, pointing out the obvious conflict of interest that existed on that city commission. 
four out of five of the commissioners at that point had been given political contributions by the uh, pre-mentioned uh, uh, now federal felon developer. Those four decided to go through with what looks to me like an, a totally unlawful interpretation of city code by city legal at that point. One of those commissioners called me a venomous uh, uh, discourse, uh, accused me of venomous discourse. He later became the mayor and then later became a federal felon additionally. So I would just uh, at once again ask the city commission to really consider the importance of having a full record for the public's input into this. We're not just the audience. We are an audience, but we are also engaged and sometimes deliver information that the commissioners need to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comment on this? Is there any online comment? No, Mayor. I'll bring that back to the commission. Go ahead. Make a motion to uh, approve the uh, city commission meetings from 9 13 22. Second. I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That, pass Aye. that passes four to zero. That brings us to C6B. Yes, my name's Ted Boyle, North Lawrence Improvement Association. And talking to this item of uh, the development on 3rd and Mill Street, for the last year and a half, I've been working with the developer uh, on Mill Street, this project, and apparently the planners in the city don't know where Mill Street is. Uh, originally, they thought it was down in Walnut Park and uh, had to show them that it wasn't. Uh, where its present location is. It's been there since the 1890s. And to the subject of Mill Street, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, uh, a resident called me and said that she got, a, uh, she called uh, David Cronin, a uh, city engineer, about some brush in the alley. And he told her that the alley, uh, Mill Street, was private roads, private drives. Uh, they weren't a street anymore and uh, that residents would have to take care of the brush. That being said, I know they removed the street signs out about uh, 2018. They pulled them up and we didn't see them anymore. And uh, so she called me upset and I called uh, Cronin and for about 30, 40 minutes on the phone, I debated with him about vacating uh, Mill Street, three and 400 block. And he was avid that he did, said he did, but he could not tell me when they did it and why residents and North Lawrence Improvement didn't get uh, notice of it. And uh, unless pulling up the street signs, one on Fifth Street, across street from Woodlawn, and the one at the end of Mill Street down by the church, 400 block, Fourth Street. And so he avidly uh, debated this with me, and I was questioning him about it. And then it came to, to the deal that the residents on each side of Mill Street inherited half the street. And uh, that's what he told us. And so the residents were going, oh, really? And uh, like I said, uh, said it was a private road, and we would have to take care of it. So then about a year and a half later, uh, the developer, John Davis, uh, wants to do a project at 300 Mill Street, uh, three houses, and came to North Lawrence Improvement and asked if we would support it. And so he gave us an outline on it, and it was supposed to be affordable housing, three of them, on a lot the church owned on Mill Street. And so he purchased it from the church and purchased a lot from me next to it to make it big enough so it had plenty adequate Fine. storm water. And so what I'm asking is this to be deferred to a regular city agenda in the future. And I have spoken with the developer and he's good with it because how can you dedicate easements and right-of-ways when you don't know where the damn street is? 
And so uh, that's what I asked the commission, uh, is to defer it. And he he's good with this, deferring it, so. Thank you, Ted. Uh -huh. Is there anyone else uh, who wants to comment on this item? Is there any? Okay. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll run. Um, I can answer any questions. Um, I mean, we believe, I know Teddy and John have been talking about this. I mean, it's been a long road. I think we've worked on this. He's right for like a year and a half. Um, but we think the Mill Street right of way is still there, but they don't, nobody wants us to build that street. So we're using the alley. Um, but uh, that's the plat that we worked on with the city. So uh, again, I'm happy to answer any questions and can talk about it if we need to. Thank you. <clears throat> Hold on before you ask. Let's make sure there's no other public comment. Uh, no, Mayor. Okay, let's bring it back to the commission. You have a question? Yeah, um, Paul, are you saying that the applicant, I know Ted said he had talked to the, to the applicant. Uh, is does the applicant asking for this to be moved for to a future agenda? Um, I don't. I don't believe so. I. Um, I mean, to be fair, uh, I own part of this with John and with a third individual. I mean, we have worked on this for a year and a half. This is the best we can get out of the city. Um, I mean, I wish there was different things about it, but this is. Um, this is where we landed and um, we have public improvement plans already approved um so i'm, I'm not sure how else to answer that and you have a question i would just like to hear from staff about um, what mr wolf said regarding his concerns this is becky pepper with planning so the item before you tonight is a minister it's a, a minor subdivision, which is an administrative process. And what is on the agenda would be the acceptance of two different types of easements. One is a utility easement that runs, runs along the south property line of those three proposed lots. And then the other is an access easement that would kind of skirts uh, the northeast corner and would allow for, for turnaround. Um, the, these three lots would be accessed. Um, the proposal for these three lots is that they would be accessed via um, alley right of way. Um, it's a little bit unusual uh, design that we, we normally see. Um, and this was um, developed uh, working with the applicant and staff as a means to help protect some of that green space, the park there to the south, um, while still being able to develop these three residential lots and provide that, that access. Thank you. I guess I have a question for Ted then. Ted, do you want this deferred so you have a vehicle to have this discussion, or you you want no, this I deferred talk, for uh, because you don't think John it's proper? Today. I talked to John Davis today, and me and him had a discussion about this. And the deal is, is uh, the easement that uh, uh, takes a position of a 20-foot street running down Mill Street uh, takes people's property on the north side of the street. And I talked to John today, uh, me and him talked about it. And uh, I told him, I said, here's the deal, man. If you're against it, I won't go up there. But if I don't hear from you, I said, I'm gonna go up there. And he said, okay. So here I am. And he's discussed this and we've debated this with the fire department and planning of where Mill Street is, was. And uh, it's like, if they don't know where the street is accurately, and uh, then how can you give easements and right-of-ways? And the people that live along the north side yeah. of Mill Street are concerned how much property they're going to lose with a 20-foot wide street, uh, paved street coming down through there. And also Matt Bond has looked at it, and he goes, stormwater. Where's the stormwater going to go? Because it has to travel down the north side of the levee through... Walnut Park, and then go a block okay. down the side of the lake. Well, we're not going to. 
Got it. I, I don't want to get into the argument, you, but you want, I mean, you think this shouldn't be approved, not that you just want to have a discussion about it. Well, I just and Paul, I mean, want to know uh, why we were told it was vacated. There are several well, that's, things but that that's are different. happening. Okay. Thank you. I hate to ask this question, Becky. Huh. If that's vacated, the people would surely know because their taxes would have increased by that amount of footage, right? So is it clear or unclear whether that is vacated? I think there are two different points of discussion happening here. What this proposes is using um, existing alley right-of-way. So they're not proposing um, dedicating or vacating any any right-of-way. This is solely using um, that alley right-of-way that, uh, that exists. Uh, there is Mill Street that uh, may be a point of discussion on whether or not that exists. I haven't been privy to those conversations, but that would be located south of these properties. The alley access is located on the north side. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Mr. Warner, um, would that make any difference uh, whatsoever to what you're trying to accomplish here? Um, well, let me, so I, I'd agree with everything Becky just said that, um, and what you implied about vacating the right of way, we think the right of way for Mill Street is still there, um, but we're not using it. Um, it is south of all of this property. We're using the alley. Um, and what may be confusing is even though the alley is 20 feet wide, we have a small easement from the church to the northeast in order to make our, to construct the alley that the, city's re that the city is requiring, um, which is different than um, the Mill Street right of way, which is south of this property. Um, if we if we built Mill Street in the right of way, it would destroy a pretty decent portion of the city park, which is why since the alley was already 20 feet wide, that's why we focused everything on using the alley. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thank you. So Becky, just to clarify, this these properties have access to f fire and medical and trash services. That is correct. As part of this um, resident as a residential development, the alley would would be needed to brought uh, up to city standards. So it, there would be some alley improvements that would take place. It doesn't involve adding additional right of way or to the alley, um, but improving it uh, standards so that it could be accessed by um, emergency services and, and our sanitation department. And part of the, the turnaround that is proposed on the west side of the property would be able to facilitate turning movements of those vehicles. Who would, Becky, who would be responsible for the maintenance of, of this um, street alley? Uh, Paul, let me know if I miss, if I, if you've had, uh, more conversations here, but, uh, as it being city right of way, it would be city. I, I'd agree with that, but we are, we are building that alley to, um, the city standards, which is eight inches of concrete. So that alley is going to be one of the best streets in North Lawrence, um, but it's all through public improvement plans. And I agree with Becky that it's in the right of way. Um, so hopefully there shouldn't be any maintenance on it for a long time, um, but it would be a brand new, essentially a brand new street where the alley is. Will it be called Mill Street? Um, we, we are gonna call it Mill Street. Um, it seemed like the best answer. Um, we were gonna put, I wanna say, I think it's one of the brown signs when it's it's not green because it's not necessarily the street, um, but we will put um, a Mill Street sign, I believe where the, where the alley um, meets 4th Street. Any other questions? Commissioner Littlejohn? Uh, yeah, it, it seems like, like 
that seems to be the basis of the confusion is like you'll have an alley um, called Mill Street, but then a street to the south that was it used to be Mill Street that we're not going to touch. Is there any way to? Are we holding hard and fast on the name Mill Street for the Alley Street? I mean, just to kind of allay future misunderstandings or confusion. Um, you know, I think. Go ahead, Becky. I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just say I think as of now we have uh, um, uh, drafted a, an address memo that uses um, Mill Street. I can certainly um, talk with staff that's responsible for that, and that could be something that we could reconsider. But Paul, if you had other considerations. No, I'd, I'd agree. You know, if, if it was, um, it's only one lot off of Fourth Street. And again, it's only three lots. So once we think the address memo is logged into everybody's GIS and stuff, this seemed to make the most sense um, as opposed to we didn't, I'm not sure we, we talked about naming it a different street. Um, but since it is, like I said, I think it's only one lot west of Fourth Street. Um, I think I think people figure it out, um, but it was the best we could come up with with city staff and that everybody could agree to. Thank you. Any other discussion? Well, I guess I'm happy to have a discussion at some point about Mill Street, but but since this is about the the alley to the north um, and the one of at least part of part owner and the and the person who filed that Paul Warner is not asking for it to be moved, I would probably proceed with this and we can have another discussion maybe at some point about Mill Street. And I'm open. Yeah, I would be fine. I would be fine with that. But I definitely want to make sure we have that discussion. Yeah, how do we want to direct staff on that, Brandon? <laughs> so directed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I'd make a motion to accept the dedications of access and utility easements associated with the minor subdivision MS 21201 for Mills 4th Street Edition in the city of Lawrence, Douglas County, Kansas. Second. I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes four to zero. Thank you very much. That brings us to public comment. The public is allowed to speak on items or issues that are not scheduled for discussion on the agenda. As a general practice, the commission will not discuss or debate these items, nor will the commission make a decision on items presented during this time. Individuals should address all comments and questions to the commission. Each person will be limited to three minutes. Manny, anybody? Sign in right here. Mm -hmm. Hi there. I'm Manda Jolly, and I'm one of the owners of The Roost, located down on the 900 block of Massachusetts Street. And I'm here today to talk to you about um, sidewalk dining. Um, recently, an updated parklet program was put out, which allows restaurants and bars to continue the use of parking spaces on mass for additional seating. And um, my restaurant, as well as a few others, are located mid-block, which puts us uh, just north of the, of the crosswalks. Um, with this location, no parking spaces are in front of our building. Um, and since there are no parking spaces for us to use, the city let us start using additional sidewalk space across from us um, during the pandemic. Um, this extra space has been absolutely crucial to our survival through the pandemic and um, we're still recovering and it continues to help us with that. It may not look like much space with only two tables out there, but uh, we completely survive on cash flow. And um, there's still a lot of people that don't wanna eat inside. There's people who've never wanted to eat inside. Um, some people just like to be outside and it really gives us flexibility to help accommodate our guests. Um, not only that, well, why I'm speaking about it is um, this, sorry, 
why I'm speaking about it is that, and also another reason is um, so that vehicle, so there's no obstruction of view for um, pedestrians. Sorry, I just saw my time. Um, I invite you to come down and see the space with our seating in place. There is still well over 200 square foot for crowds to gather. Um, there's tons of space there. And we intentionally have no walls. Um, Mother Nature can decide for herself when we can use the outdoors. We even got rid of our propane heaters last year for multiple reasons, expense, environmental reasons, things like that. But um, I'm not speaking against any current parklets as they are now, but also with the boundaries there already, the, the planter boxes and stuff, there's no need for like orange cones or unsightly things. Um, it's really nice space. We're taking good care of it. Um, we'd like Time. to pay the city to continue using that space. And we'd like you to reconsider um, the wording in that. And I know I have emailed you a lot more information. I'll email you more. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Sue Herrink. I'm here tonight because recently I emailed all of you asking for Courtney Shipley's resignation. I received no responses, so tonight I'm asking for all of your resignations because you did not at least censor her for the racist remarks she made at the meeting two weeks ago when she made the remark about not appointing white men to any advisory board all of you should have been out of your seats and in her face. All of you pose as being equitable and anti-racist. So why not stand for your values? The only answer is that you have none. You're posers. The other reason I'm asking for all your resignations tonight is for contributing to the tax burden here in Lawrence by inflating property values. The inflation is the most insidious tax. My husband and I are landlords. We have a mom and pop operation where we do everything ourselves. We know our tenants and where every dollar goes in our business. If we were to compensate for the damage that your policies have done to our business, we would have to raise our tenants' rent by $100 a month. Your policies have increased the cost of our insurance, our mortgages, and added $55 per unit in taxes per month. Our tenants, like all people, are withstanding increases in utilities by 33%, gas by 26%, groceries by 13%, and electricity by 16%. There is no way we can rationalize adding to our tenants' burdens to try and cut, recover from what you've done. Why is that? Why don't we behave like you do? Could it be that we know that the quickest, surest way to ruin our business is to, to destroy the livelihood of others? That's where your policies are steering this city. You are ruining the livelihoods of businesses and families. The city doesn't stand a chance under your influence. Please resign tonight. As you know, we do request that you not clap then you will be removed. Next. Oh, thank you. And your comments. Permission to speak. Can I have permission to speak? Mr. Katie. Okay, my name's Dan Katie. I've got a quote from uh, the September 10th Lawrence Journal World. It says, utility funds are enterprise funds, meaning the rates charged to residents are set to cover the personnel, maintenance, and other costs of operating the utility service. Also in that article, it talked about $8.15 million that the city commission was trying to get funded uh, sustainability projects on capital improvement. 
I didn't see anything in in the statement I just made that mentioned using discretionary funds for CIP projects or sustainability projects. This is a little information about budgets. I got this off of your your uh, the city's website in in 2021. 10.4 surplus in the waste water and waste wastewater fund and the balance was 27.3 2022 2.2 surplus balance of 29.5 now we go to 23 2023 budgeted for a 4.7 million dollar surplus with a 34.2 million dollar balance why is this money needed here why can't this money go to the to the people to the residents people are hurting you just heard the numbers on inflation people can't afford to get groceries and you're going to put another extra five million dollars into this fund why can somebody tell me that why is that $5 million, you're taking it out of everybody's pockets and putting it here. Why not just let them spend it? Let them spend it. It's not your money. You don't have a problem spending other people's money. Also, if you did this, if you, re if you reduce this to zero, do it for a year. Th then you could make a decision after that, maybe you wouldn't need to spend $67,000 for a, a utility assistance director to try to find ways to, to ease burden on a certain group of people. Why? Why is that? And is that right? Time. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name's Nicole. Could we lower her so I can see? I'm sorry? No, it's all right. Thank you. This is regarding the proposals of the Liberal City uh, Council people here to further stifle free speech within Lawrence. Liberals know that if they limit conservatives' ability to speak, they control what enters other people's minds. Jesus spoke on our ability to freely speak. He said, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Whoever shows injustice will reap calamity and the rod of their fury will fail. Your quest to silence us will backfire because it will only make us stronger and more determined. And we promise to make you famous on the internet. You give us plenty of material. Today's liberal leadership is only made possible because they censor us. Liberals fear that if they don't maintain control of all the media, the opposition's message will get out to the masses. Therefore, liberals being in control is not legitimate. This is why the Lawrence Journal world sits safely over there behind these room dividers. Liberal politicians fear us because they know we are brave and will never bend the knee to local or federal government. So their only option is to suppress our words. The president has told the world that we are extremists and a threat to our country, making it more difficult for us to freely live our lives. And while there's a target on our backs, liberal government officials work to silence us even further. The combination of calling us enemies of the state and censoring us makes our situation even more dangerous as our ability to verbally protest government is eliminated. To those who hear this public comment, maybe for the last time, where are the men in Douglas County who believe in free speech promised in the Constitution? Where are those men now that half of American citizens are censored more than ever? Being a member of the silent majority is not a badge of honor. Be brave and take more risks because those who have decided not to stand up for our freedoms need to understand that one day it will be their rights that are trampled on and their words that are silenced. For those of you who are beginning to sense that we are losing America to a Marxist agenda, 
you need to join in, speak out, push back, and get involved in any way you can. We must work relentlessly to preserve freedom for our children. The following is by an unknown author. It didn't start with a gas chamber. It started with one party controlling the media, one party controlling the message, one party deciding what truth is, one party censoring speech and silencing opposition, one party dividing citizens into us versus them and calling on their side to harass the other. It started when good people, like some of those here, especially you, Brad, who turned a blind eye and let it happen to their fellow countrymen. My name is Michael Lawrence Countability, but I think everybody knows that. I thought this would be a good time to chime in because, Courtney, your racism and your sexism is on display again. I saw you lean forward like you wanted to stop that comment because it was talking about the agenda item that's later tonight, but you just couldn't bring yourself to do it. Was it because she's female, not a white male? I don't know. But your inconsistencies are, are clear and clear. And I wonder if you guys have told Mr. Boyle that he's not gonna be able to pull any more of these consent items. And the reason you're doing this is because I got fed up with your bullshit. Because there's several men sitting in this room tonight that participated in the cover-up of the assault, excessive force, and improper transport of a person suspected of petty crime. I got fed up with your bullshit ignoring it. You guys say it's important and you talk about second reviews and all this stuff, but you're just saying shit, it doesn't matter. And we can see about the way you engaged on that consent agenda with uh, Mr. Boyle, where your priorities are. You, the safe and secure is a, is a cliche little word for you guys, because there are citizens out here that are not safe and secure. And you guys have not taken step one to show that you care about them, not one step. I have all the communications to prove how many times you've been told about these issues. And I have the lies in the communications that I've been told about second reviews and we're looking into this and we're looking into that. So we've had officers that deny constitutional rights, interfere with constitutional expression. And now we have officer, at least one, done with the assistance of a sergeant who's in this room, trying to criminalize the free expression of the First Amendment and the Second Amendment on our streets. But you don't care. So you're gonna shut down public comment. You're gonna shut down, do whatever you want. And you sit here and show, you show us exactly how you feel about the less. I think Jesus also said some things about the way you treat the less of it, less of me or the less of us is how you treat everybody. That's the way you see everybody. Sorry that you're too full of yourself, Courtney. Hello, I'm Linda Winemaster. I have some concerns about the homeless encampment campments that will be taking place here in Lawrence. I moved here from Denver in 2018, and I saw a lot of this stuff going on out there. And what was going on out there, it, it really concerns me what could happen here. Will the people in these uh, camps be held to the same laws that I'm held to? Will law enforcement officers be able to go into these camps and arrest people that have war outstanding warrants? I am concerned for our safety. I have a friend that has a field in their backyard and they have these homeless people coming up and using their water, knocking on the door and asking for items and it's frightened them. And I, I don't want to see what's going on in Denver and it has gotten worse because I follow it. Um, 
There's now the growing threat of these organized retail uh, crime sprees that they bring all these people into these tent. And I mean, there's homeless people that are going to be hurt by this also, but they bring people from outside of the city in, and then they are protected in this community after they commit crimes. Um, that's one of my concerns. And this, if this is happening here, it will punish all the law abiding citizens. It will cost us dearly uh, as it already is by your putting, raising our prop property taxes, the increased taxation. Um, you're stealing our life away from us. We're retired. We don't have a way to make money other than we, what we save for our rainy day. Um, let's see. And here we're bankrupting Lawrence. Soon, the bus system will be free, but it will be not safe for anyone, including the bus driver. Have you ever seen who gets on a bus and rides around for 24 hours a day at a time? It's usually people that don't have any place to go. And if I was a bus driver, I would be frightened. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Campbell. Last week, I was shocked when I was made aware of the front page article in the Journal World informing Lawrence citizens that the city had agreed to donate a downtown parking lot for Burt Nash to build housing for the homeless. The paper reported that there are approximately 160 permanently homeless people in Lawrence. We are and should be concerned about our fellow citizens who are in need. But I am more concerned about the welfare of the thousands of people who live and work downtown and the thousands of our people who come downtown to shop and eat and wonder about and just enjoy themselves. I've worked downtown long enough to remember when the property owners and the city leaders worked together to create a benefit district to build the block long parking lot in the 800 block of Vermont Street. Those property owners were happy to help finance that parking lot in order to make our citizens more comfortable to shop downtown with free parking in that lot and others. That lot is full almost every day and we are so very grateful every day for those customers who choose to shop downtown. The businesses on Mass Street are crucial to the economic and social welfare of Lawrence. Building this facility will draw in more homeless and destroy the safe environment we all want for our downtown. These are difficult times. You already raised all our taxes. Where do you think you will be getting the money? Any money Burt Nash is getting from the federal government only adds to the national debt. At least recognize that there are other locations that will not destroy the economy of downtown. Downtown is not the proper location for this housing. Thank you. Can you hear me? I want to thank all of my fellow citizens in this room that took time away from their busy lives to speak out this evening. It gives me hope that we will defeat the evil that has taken a grip on our town. I'm not the only citizen that was surprised to open the paper last Friday morning to see yet another horrible misuse of our taxpayer money. The proposed Burt Nash Homeless Center in the heart of our downtown business district is a gross misuse of funds and very valuable public property. Just a few short years ago, money was spent to build our community shelter at the eastern edge of town. This was not only to help house the homeless, but to receive to relieve the downtown of the burden and unsafe nature of the homeless problem. 
that community shelter is not currently running anywhere near its capacity, neither the new Monarch homes. So why would we be using more taxpayer money to build something else? And why were the downtown merchants not consulted on this subject? Downtown Lawrence is the heart of this city and brings a lot of town of a lot of guests to our city that provide sales tax revenue. Many of those customers comment to me daily of the unsafe and unclean nature of our downtown due to the drug addicted panhandlers. So our customers are telling us that the downtown is ill. It's dying a slow death. If you bring that building to the downtown area and continue the lack of consequence to the behavior that takes place from our homeless, you will be putting a nail in the coffin of downtown Lawrence, which will affect thousands of Lawrence residents, not just the 160 houseless. Lawrence clearly has a problem on its hands, but I feel this project is hasty and not well thought out. Have you all asked yourselves, why do we even have a homeless problem here? Could it be that surrounding co communities are sending their homeless here to Lawrence? Could it be that our open heart and lack of accountability is being taken advantage of by those communities? I am not without compassion for those that are down on their luck. I fully support the Family Promise programs that are run successfully through our local churches. I ask you to please reconsider the project that is planned for downtown Lawrence with Burt Nash. My name is Dr. Justin Spies. I'm running for Douglas County Commissioner in District 1 as a Republican candidate. Tonight, the commission here is going to vote unanimously to censor uh, general public comment along with the other, uh, other things in the, the name of uh, streamlining their, their meetings. And I ask, why, why now? Why, why not six months ago? Why not a year ago? Why now? And uh, the answer is, is obvious. So it's, it's when the opposition started showing up. So me and my group, we started showing up started voicing our concerns and you can't just shut one person down you can't shut two people down or a group of people so you got to shut everybody down in the, in the name of equity and lawrence i mean and that, that's you guys they shut down they're going to shut down the whole the whole city you can't come in here and, and and talk no more the way that they want and you know brad finkel die i call you a rhino basically a democrat and the reason is i mean look at you last week man you were fully on board with this sense censorship and you're going to be fully on board with it tonight why man what, what republican values do you demonstrate by trying to shut us down like that so it's all done in the name of trying to streamline it. Now we got a, lit, a litmus test here. So we're not going to come in here and talk no more because we've been censored. But your meetings are still going to go. They're notorious for going five and a half hours, six hours every single night. It has nothing to do with us. Now we're going to now we're going to find out it's not. It's because you guys talk too much, man. You talk too much about the the stupidest things, man. Just to hear your voice, just talk, talk, talk. I suggest we cap how long you guys get to talk. Once you guys give thirty minutes for each item, so you guys can shut your mouths and put to put together some solutions to these problems. <clears throat> so I just, uh, I just recently started a, a YouTube channel. Uh, I'd encourage you all to go out and, and, and check it out. It's uh, Dr. Justin Spies. It's D-R period Justin Spies. My last name is spelled S-P-I-E-H-S. I got some videos on there talking about what I'm all about as a candidate, my thoughts and views on stuff. Uh, I just uploaded a video today. It's called Tabor Talk, and that's T-A-B-O-R, and that's an acronym that stands for the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, which is a, an amendment that the state of Colorado uh, recently, or uh, back in 1992, enacted. And I, if I'm elected county commissioner, that, that's uh, that's something that I would like to uh, propose to help with uh, the taxes out here. Now, Tabor is really cool. Now, get on, watch my video, and, and get online. You can check out Tabor more for yourself. But it's really cool because it proposes uh, a cap on how much revenue the uh, 
the county would be able to collect and, and, be, and in the process of capping how much revenue, by default, they have to cap how much is, is spent as well. And anything that goes over that cap gets refunded back to the citizens. So like right now, Colorado is getting $750 refund checks for the individuals and $1,500 for, for families. So what that does is it holds people accountable. Just recently, Lawrence Times wrote an article about how Burt Nash is ineffective and inefficient in their services that they provide, but yet we, the county still gives them millions of dollars. If we had something that held them accountable and held our uh, held, held the county commissioners uh, uh, responsible and accountable, Fine. they wouldn't just give a blank check over to them and, and keep asking for more taxes and more of your tax money. They would be held accountable. And we'd say, you can't just keep giving money out like that. And in the process, if, if it goes over and there is a surplus, then what we'll do then is we'll put it to a vote to the community to decide if you guys want those refund checks or if you want to have the, the, uh, the community go ahead and spend that money. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Along with that, any time that there's Thank an you. increase in tax proposed by any of the time commissioners, then what has to happen is it goes Thank to a vote to much. the community. You can either say yes or no, but consider a vote for me. Thank you. Appreciate it. My name is Joe Herrick, and uh, 235 years ago, there was 39 men that signed the declaration, or excuse me, signed the uh, United States Constitution. At that time, they pledged their life, their fortune, and their sacred honor. And I'm pretty sure they didn't limit debate to three minutes. And now I'd like to review just a little bit about the COVID response in our community. Granted, when it first arrived, Everybody was in dismay. Uh, that was in late 2019. We went through lockdowns. We went through social distancing. We uh, had to wear masks, on and on. But by March of 20, there were doctors that have put together protocols that successfully treat COVID-19. And to this day, they're still being censored. They put together cheap, generic drugs. But one of the doctors that's being censored, and he's censored today, is the most highly published cardiologist in the world. And when you look around and see how our community responded can you honestly say we did anything right? I can't think of anything. We have communities in our state that didn't lock down. They didn't put masks on kids. And they got on better than we did. So I don't understand how we could be so backward. And I would like to remind everybody that I don't know of one elected official that has lived up to their oath of office, that being supporting the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Kansas. 53 years ago, I took an oath as I entered the military, and I still abide by that oath. And I want to know how you can sit there and not support the Constitution and still put out these so-called laws. I just want to know why Fine. you don't support the Constitution. Hi, Commissioners. I'm Amy Buffman, a Lawrence resident. Um, I wasn't going to speak during public comments, but I'll speak later too. But, well, I've just heard some stuff up here, like about Burt Nash. And I just recently heard a story about them from a very good friend of mine whose her son um, couldn't get his medication. 
And so he ended up kind of, you know, going off the kilter there and ended up in jail. So they're really not doing that good anyways. So I really think they should be held accountable for, I mean, the outcome of all the money that our tax dollars go to them. So, and I think it's a really bad idea to move that homeless place downtown. There's already plenty of people ha panhandling down there. Um, th downtown's very nice. I like to go down there. And sometimes it is a bit of a nuisance and kind of, I mean, I believe in helping people too, but it's kind of gross sometimes. So I would appreciate if you guys would really consider not doing that and figuring something else out. And especially if the businesses downtown like used their money to help build that parking lot. I mean, that's not really fair to them. People go there and park for their businesses. I mean, I park in all those parking lots downtown at least a couple times a week. So I don't think that's a fair consideration for the people who own businesses down there in, you know, I just think it would be good if you guys consider that to be somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> My name is Jeffrey Ward. I'm the general manager of Ramen Bowls on Lawrence, Kansas at 918 Mass. I'm asking you to reconsider the sidewalk hospitality area parklet code, um, along with fellow restaurant owners like Manda right over here. Uh, the parklet that provides three dining areas for us is crucial to our survival. Um, it increases our daily revenue significantly. It allows my servers to take home tips and it helps us collect some sales tax. Um, the Lawrence Restaurant Association alerted me to it on Facebook, and I'm just asking you guys to reconsider um, the code that is asking us to take down that parking dining area. Thank you. Any further public comment in the room? Oh. Hi, I'm Chris Flowers. Um, I just want to say I, I support the homeless being downtown. And I say if the homeless want to be downtown, let the homeless be where they want to be at. But I, what I really came here to talk about is I do agree that we are wasting money. And I just found out today because I, I knew it was going on about the whole rebranding process the city's going. I didn't know that we... We, we're spending a hundred thousand dollars on a consultant to come up with a logo and and what words we use to describe ourselves i mean if we're going to talk about wasting money a hundred thousand dollars for a, a new logo and just telling people about ourselves we can't like we city staff can't figure that out themselves that we're spending a hundred K on an out, out of state consultant. And also um, I noticed earlier, you said we're not supposed to clap at, at city commission meetings, but didn't we all clap at the proclamation for the electric cars? And here's why I bring that up. What if um, some Republican during their public comment wanted to say, hey, I'm against this electric car stuff and, and we need to keep up with American gas. We would not be allowed to applause that. So why is it okay that we're encouraged to clap when the city issues some kind of response, but when a citizen makes some kind of response that goes maybe goes against what the city's um, city statement is, that we can't clap for that? It just seems. Uh, uh, I mean, if you're going to do it fair, why why do we need to clap for proclamations? I mean, the amount p people were clapping for that is less than the amount of time people clap after a public comment. So thank you. Uh, Jeremy Rothkuschel, Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, for anybody who's interested in how we might uh, create a much more robust and vigorous long-term city tax base while also engaging government at a proper and effective size. They can look at my uh, public general public comment uh, written 
which has links about the Henry George land value tax uh, with lots of good info about how we might use that uh, for our tax base here. Additionally, in general public comment, I would like to point out that the city, including the city commission, apparently is still condoning uh, and apparently endorsing the Lawrence Police Department's use of a Israeli intelligence software, BriefCam. We've also used it apparently through Lawrence Police Department uh, called uh, Israeli intelligence software called Celebrite. And I would just point out that it has just come out, uh, and I will read from a Mondo Weiss article titled, New Evidence Emerges Showing Israel Deliberately Targeted Shireen Abu Akleh as Family Files International Criminal Court Complaint. New forensic analysis shows Shireen Abu Akleh was, quote, deliberately and repeatedly targeted, unquote, by an Israeli military sniper taking, quote, precise and careful aim, unquote, by David Kattenberg. Imagine if we, if our Lawrence Police Department, condoned, endorsed by the city at large, had brought in South African apartheid software that was then used to target a Washington Post journalist, then hacked up by another foreign government, or uh, the South African apartheid white supremacist government had targeted a black American woman journalist for precise assassination and then lied about it and blamed the, the, the black folk for it for months and months and months. And that, then after finally admitting that the South African apartheid white supremacist government had killed the black woman American journalist, they then continued to lie by saying that they did it unintentionally until the black woman American journalist's family had to go to the International Criminal Court in order to show the evidence that the white supremacist South African apartheid government had targeted that black woman American journalist over and over for assassination and then targeted her co call, journalistic colleagues when they were trying to help her. And then we were going to go ahead and utilize an endorsed software from that white apartheid South African supremacist government for our own police department here. This Jewish American patriot of conscience says Time. no. Any further comment? Is there anyone online who would like to make public comment? Stephen Watts. Lots and lots of time wasted with saber rattling about civility and decorum from the commission, which is so civil. It allowed our town police department to choke people to death and to enter homes without knocking by police department policy, not to mention other missed opportunities, all the while acquiescing to what are essentially demands to be secretive with the public from our town paid staff lawyers, what with Kansas reported to be one of the most secretive states in the nation, if not the most secretive. And those are just two examples from a single department. Other town departments struggle with understanding they work for the people of the town and not their own worlds. The concerted effort to eliminate, defund two people's favorites in the Prairie Park Nature Center and the Humane Society is an example of poor leadership coming not only from the town manager's office, but also the specific departments. So ever willing to give up a town service because it does not support itself through charging citizens to enter and take part. Once these elected officials deal with the incivility of examples such as these, they'll be in a genuine position to make such meanderings. Civility is pretty much a buzzword and doesn't really mean a whole lot in these matters. It's a control effort. The commission has grown complacent over time as the people trusted their actions more and more, even to the point where many town meetings had no participants and this guy, city staff, has been ecstatic even to the point of building things with criminals. He's now upset because people have started returning to meetings, which for the longest time were simply not attended or at least didn't have any participants. Profit motive thinking has seemingly taken over my town executive team. 
with their efforts to close two much loved and needed services of our town thwarted, these civil servants were compelled to stop their plan cuts. But in so doing, they also painted a target on each program, become self-sufficient or perish. The thrust to compel each and every program in town to pay its own way belies a wanton ignorance of one of the many reasons we have government, and that is to provide service. Insisting programs and services be self-sufficient in order to prevail is a thumbing of the nose at the folks who do not have 401k program and live paycheck to paycheck in a country topsy-turvy with concerted and concentrated wealth and Time. influence. It documents just how far removed from the pulse of regular people local government may have become. Thank you. Anyone else online? No, Mayor. All right, thank you. That will bring us to our work session. The work session provides an opportunity for the city commission to discuss items in greater detail. As a general practice, the commission will not make decisions on items presented during this time. Rather, they will refer the items to staff to follow up if necessary. Work session topics are eligible for live public comment. Each person will be limited to three minutes. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Rich Llewellyn. I'm the Fire Chief for Lawrence Douglas County Fire Medical. I'm here tonight presenting with my fellow uh, Safe and Secure um, Champion, Safe and Secure Outcomes Champion, Rich Lockhart. Uh, and we're here to introduce members of our staff who are leading innovative programs uh, that either are or will be uh, improving the lives of the citizens and, and residents and visitors of Lawrence and Douglas County. and. Uh, um, how tonight will work is uh, we'll, I'll present um, or introduce Kevin Joles from FireMed, and he'll talk about the Mobile Integrated Healthcare Program, and then Chief Lockhart will get up and introduce his folks who will be uh, talking about their program. So with that, I'll introduce Chief Joles. Just gonna have, <clears throat> gonna have a short intermission while I lower this podium, but give me a few minutes here. All right, so tonight I'm here to present um, a new program um, that'll be launched in January of 2023 called Mobile Integrated Health. This team will provide non-emergency health services to Douglas County residents and help match them with the right resources at the right time. This team will work with the already established Douglas County Mobile Crisis Response Team, Douglas County My Resource Connection Program and Partners, Lawrence PD Co-Responder, and numerous other partners in Douglas County. This outreach program will allow for the opportunities for those residents that have difficulty navigating their physical and mental health, as well as some of life issues, to find the resources to aid them in a successful resolution. This team will be a bridge for many of our patients that we see daily, thus reducing repetitive visits by EMS and fire resources. The team will be comprised of up to two paramedics and an unnamed partner, as this is a program that's still under development, which we are hopeful will be a mid-level providers such as an advanced, um, advanced practice registered nurse practitioner who could play an important role in the mobile integrated health program in not only providing a higher level of medical care, but also providing evidence-based approaches to patient care, such as teaching self-management to patients, emphasizing seamless care coordination for all patients and adjusting services that fit the patient needs. The team will operate on a 40-hour work schedule uh, as we're developing the program, um, the second partner to be named, um, uh, hopeful that it'll be a, a, a mid-level provider of some sort, uh, most likely Monday through Friday, depending on demand. As you can see here, um, these are some rough estimates. Data collection in the mental health space has not been something that we've done very well. Um, in efforts to create uh, a better uh, opportunity to do that over the next 
12 to 18 months, we'll be able to collect data a little bit more advantageously. So as you can see here, just over 19 of our patients per thousand have some type of mental health associated in the calls that we respond to. With the recent deployment of the mobile crisis response team and Lawrence uh, PD co-responder program, we'll definitely have overlap in, patient, uh, in patients, but in efforts to reduce duplication, we will work closely with our partners to find solution for their ongoing care. We can allude to the fact that the numbers are not accurate. Since this is the first time we have really come to see come about in regards to data collection in the mental health space, the gathering of data moving forward will be collected in a different fashion, providing higher quality data in the future. Why is there a need in this community? Simply because we have people. We have people from all walks of life. LDCFM has been hopeful to stand up a mobile integrated health program for many years, and thanks to Douglas County and the partners, the ongoing discussion we have obtained and ongoing discussion we have obtained the funding to move this program forward. Until recently, we collectively have not been successful in executing what we have been collaborating for many of years. Many providers, city and county leaders, executives, and the list goes on and on, have been yearning for answers to serve our community better. Our community is no different than any other when it comes to the pitfalls in healthcare, mental health, substance abuse, and living situations. Where we are different is the amount of individuals that need assistance for the community our size without a connection resource that can see a person through to the successful outcome. As I stated earlier, this is an ongoing build, a program build to create a more successful team than we already have, enhancing in-home care to prevent readmissions, assisting in the care in the field that prevents first-time admissions can be opportunities to keep our patients healthy and in turn reduce their medical bills. Reduction in transports means better reliability for fire trucks and EMS. Overall, this, um, we really are still kind of, we, there's no still kind of, we are still developing this program. Uh, we look forward to the partnerships that we're going to develop over the next coming weeks. Uh, looking forward to launch this early January, 2023, at least in the first quarter successfully. Um, I appreciate your time. Can I ask, ask a question on that? Sir. So I, you mentioned a couple of times the mobile response team as well as the co-responding team, and you're still setting up your program. Are you working with them as you develop the program, or is the goal to set up your own and then see how they work together, or how are you doing that? No, we absolutely will have uh, conversations prior to deploying um, and implementing anything. We do not, it's not that we don't want to overlap, we're going to see the overlap. There's no yeah. way to get around that. Um, medical calls turn into mental health and vice versa all the time. Sometimes it's at the same time. Um, we, we will develop a protocol in order to follow an algorithm that we're not stepping on anybody's toes and vice versa for them. Uh, we have great partnerships with um, the police and any mental health uh, programs that are already established. We've been working together for so long um, that this is just, it's finally culminating and finally coming into, into play. So we're very excited about it. Um, of course, we want to be first, um, not, not necessarily first in this, um, in this county or this city, but we want to be the first in innovating um, quality programs. And this is going to be, uh, you know, something that we're very excited about working with the other, um, we, we'd like to work with LMH Health, Heartland Clinic. The, the possibilities are endless um, in this space. And, and I assume without knowing, I would guess an important part of, another important part of this would be the dispatchers, knowing who to dispatch and how, how, how do you, I assume you work with them to come up with a protocol or how, how do you? Yeah, so this is, is probably gonna be more of a referral program. So the first responders that we already have, seeing these patients that we, um, that we see uh, countless times a year, uh, it may, they may be repetitive, it may be a first time. And with that being said, um, they can deploy that mobile integrated health program to the scene immediately, um, assuming that there's hours that they're working working within the hours. If not, then they'll be referred to the next working business day, um, if not following a weekend. Obviously, if there's mental health crisis, um, the mobile resource cri uh, mobile um, crisis team is available. Their hours are, are a little bit different and they're every day, uh, Monday through Sunday. So that will be helpful as well. But as far as medical calls, um, we'll still continue to run the ambulance. They'll be dispatched appropriately. Uh, this will be more of a referral program. We work um, closely with My Resource Connection. We deploy um, and give them our surveillance data in order for them to uh, make connections throughout the county. That's helpful. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. The next presentation is going to be from uh, Victim Witness Coordinator Tasha Records. 
She is, uh, it's a newly appointed position within our department, and it's one that's pretty unique within police departments. So we're really excited to have her. You'll get that energy from her as she's presenting. Presenting with her also is Officer Mark Hammond. He's been working with her to develop some new solutions for dealing with domestic violence programs. And um, Commissioner Finkeldi, thanks for that preview. Um, the next safe and secure update, we're gonna have our folks come in to talk about the co-responder model, the mental health teams, and also the new treatment center. So get a little preview of coming attractions there. Also, Chief Llewellyn and I have already had conversations about combining these efforts and trying to co-locate some of them. So we should have some more information on that for you for next session as well. And I'll turn it over to Tasha and Mark now. Oh, I'm good. Hello, Commissioners. Hello, Mayor. My name is Tasha Records, and I'm the Victim Services Coordinator, as Chief said, and with the Special Victims Unit at LPD. And this is... Officer Mark Hammond. I'm a patrol officer assigned to the midnight shift. So this first slide you're going to look at, uh, part of SAS 9 includes the sexual assaults, and so I thought it would be imperative that we address what we've done so far to date with the sexual assaults. Uh, we have, um, in December of 2020, Lawrence Police Department formed the Special Victims Unit. Over the course of a year and a half, we have expanded this team to include two additional civilian investigators and a systems-based victim advocate. This division is highly trained in investigations involving sex crimes with a trauma-informed approach. However, we are lacking with experience in sworn personnel, especially trained in domestic violence cases. Over the next several slides, we are going to propose an approach to how the police department would like to address domestic cases moving forward, using the tools that reflect a progressive model that aligns with national best practices. With your support, this can be the beginning to making a major impact with how we respond to domestic violence cases in our community. Um, okay, so this next slide, it's going to show a little bit difference in this um, graph, so just hang on there and I'll kind of explain it. The progress indicators reflected on the left are provided under the safe and secure webpage, as you probably have seen before, reflecting our domestic violence cases per 1,000 residents under a reporting tool we are now using called NIBRS. We only have one full complete year, 2021, so the numbers will be off when measuring for a three-year comparison. This system takes a more detailed approach to measure crime, allowing for us to report all criminal offenses that occur within one single incident. Thus, the 2021 domestic violence numbers will be substantially more than the graph on the right. Um, so we are looking forward to using that graph that's on the left because it will show every incident that is reported, or I'm sorry, every criminal offense that's reported within one incident. Versus right now, well, previously, the KBI required us to report through UCR, which was counting only the violent crimes per 1,000 instances. So if you look to the graph on the right side, reflects domestic violence cases per 1,000 residents, the system we have been consistently using required by the FBI until recently. It reflects the most violence, I'm sorry, yeah, like I said, it reflects the most recent violent domestic related cases per 1,000 residents over the past three years. With the new system NIBRS reporting on the left, we will be able to capture more data and report every crime related to that one domestic incident. Um, so these numbers actually reflect our domestic battery cases only for 2021, and I can't explain that enough. Uh, there are various types of domestic violence related calls reported. However, the data would be overwhelming to cover, so we chose to take domestic battery calls only to show areas of improvement and where this proposed solution will work to improve. So of the 2,265 dispatch calls in which some form of domestic violence was indicated, there was evidence of a potential domestic violent crime, domestic violence crime in 635 cases. 443 of them um, were submitted for charging by the police department to the Douglas County District Attorney's Office because officers on scene were able to establish sufficient probable cause that a crime had been committed. In 154 cases, officers were unable to establish that same probable cause. And 38 cases are currently pending investigation by law enforcement officers. Now, the purpose of the pie chart is just to provide a visual kind of representation of areas where we feel this initiative could provide improvement. Uh, starting with the gray area at the bottom left there, um, that is the no probable cause cases and represents 24% of that 635. Uh, next up is the black area on the left-hand side of the pie chart, and that represents cases where the prosecution declined to proceed. Uh, that number is 14% of that 635. And then the yellow wedge is cases pending um, investigation by law enforcement, which is 6%. The combined total of those three areas is 44%. So as you can see, of that 635 cases, 
uh, just under half could benefit from this initiative uh, in terms of follow-up and further investigation. I think the biggest question is, why are we missing some of those cases? Why are they not uh, being pursued by prosecution? Um, and just explore those options so we can learn how to improve our investigative tactics, but also the no probable cause, uh, what's going on there for training purposes to make sure that we are charging all cases to the, the most that we can possible charge if, if there is cause. That, a lot of the cases with no probable cause, it's because of maybe gun on arrival. There's a lot of different things that might show up where we don't have enough evidence or we don't have enough staff at the moment to or officers to go follow up on that call because we're shorthanded so an investigator would be able to follow up on that no probable cause or the declined and find out what the prosecution would prefer us to do next time to articulate in the report uh so also you probably have noticed that the convictions we do not have the raw data for convictions like i said for going forward i would like to propose for the da to provide us with the specifics of why uh decline prosecution we are not informed of that to an in-depth model it's more of just a, a you know a small brief description uh but that would allow us to like i said further understand where we might be falling short and where we can improve our investigative techniques uh, for the convictions, in terms of the data, we don't have it, like I said, but I would implore you to go and check out the Douglas County District Attorney's webpage, which she has provided as a transparency page for her convictions for this year um, and what she's addressed for her term. Um, engaged and empowered teams. Thank you. One of the strategies um, and progress indicators for SAS-9 was to train and equip personnel to effectively respond to and investigate incidences related to Part 1 SAS-9 offenses. Per the Police Department Comprehensive Management Study of May of 2021, certain level, it was quoted, certain level of inexperience exists with specialized detectives and investigations. The Department's Invest Investigations Division is um, comprised of highly competent and experienced personnel. However, the department is lacking a trained investigator for DV-related incidences and its organized response to repeat high-risk domestic violence cases. Through case management and review of our local DV-reported stats, along with the most recent DV-related homicide here in Lawrence, we discovered a need and are thus advocating for a domestic violence response team. This team will be composed of the Victim Services Coordinator and the newly assigned sworn investigator working together to improve investigative outcomes and reinforce victim support systems. By working together in the respective roles, the investigator and the advocate can provide better communication with victims and stronger cases overall, while helping victims heal emotionally and regain their sense of safety. Yeah. So the second strategy rec recommendation for the progress indicator of SAS-9 was to provide rapid, skilled, and appropriate response to part one offenses, domestic violence, and other serious time critical incidents. Uh, in order to achieve this, our our proposed solution is the implementation of a, a sworn domestic violence investigator. This sworn officer would interview the more serious misdemeanor and felony uh, level suspects, as well as re-interviewing victims using a trauma-informed um, trauma approach. Uh, the emphasis would be on stalking, harassment, strangulation, witness or victim tampering and intimidation, and violation of protection orders. The investigator would prioritise the investigation of cases where the suspect has gone on arrival at the time of the incident and then further investigate cases to determine all possible charges that could be brought against an offender. So the operational changes for the future which we're working towards uh, would involve implementing three risk questions which would help the responding officer at the scene document the scope, severity and pattern of abuse reported at the time of the initial response. This would help build an accurate picture of the nature of the risk and danger involved to the victim. Uh, subsequently, the, the investigator, the domestic violence investigator, would carry out a, a lethality assessment, which would be expanded from those initial three questions. Uh, an example of that is on the screen on the right there. It would be expanded from those three questions and included in the case file, which would then be forwarded to the prosecution for review. So with equity inclusion, the domestic violence response team will be a wave of change in how we investigate this persistent and pervasive form of violence in our community. However, no single organization, however innovative or powerful, can accomplish lowering domestic violence numbers alone. With your support along with interagency coordination and shared leadership, the City of Lawrence can take on a greater role in our long-term response to domestic violence. With that, I will now introduce you to the Director of the Willow Domestic Violence Center, Megan Stuckey, who will share the importance of this ambitious mission.
Thank you, Tasha and Officer Hammond. Thank you, commissioners. Um, before I kind of go into my spiel tonight, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge this because I've lived and worked in this community in education and as an advocate for 30 years, and you all know me. And most of the time you see me, I'm tired, frustrated, exhausted, and probably a little angry. Um, so it's delightful to be here tonight because I'm none of those things. I'm simply hopeful and really happy about the progress that we've made. So um, to be here tonight in collaboration with the PD is um, significant for our whole community, particularly for the Willow and for the survivors we serve. Um, this project and the potential it represents for all of our citizens is profound. DV affects every person, child, classroom, and neighborhood. Um, and if you know me, you know that I love grassroots and community efforts, but what I love even more is policy and systems that work to undo the harm that policy and systems have done before. So um, I think this represents that significant shift. Uh, a few of you may recall that I spoke to the commission on October 1st, 2019, regarding the need for coordinated efforts between advocacy, law enforcement, and prosecution for better results for victims as well as law enforcement on domestic violence cases. Since that time, we have come a long way. We've installed victim advocates in both LPD and the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. I appreciate the willingness of our local law enforcement to engage in this work with us and collaborate and move the needle but we still have work to do. It's important to note that while the PD has been asked to report and make progress on the number of reported DV cases, we see that metric differently. The reasons victims report or don't report are widely varied. While it is an admirable and real goal to work to handling cases more effectively from the first call rather than waiting for multiple and escalating calls from the same victim. It is also true that when victims feel safe and supported by responders, they are more likely to call, which is important to note when we're talking about reducing numbers, that's a messy piece of data. Um, fewer calls might also mean that we are effectively protecting victims and prosecuting offenders, but it might also mean that victims feel abandoned in the system, exhausted by it, or even harmed further by it, thus resulting in less reporting over time. So just relying on data about calls and reports of DV doesn't really give us a good picture of the efficacy of all of our systems. It is the Willow's position that the metric for success is the output. What resources, training, expertise, trauma-informed care are we growing and improving? What connections are we intentionally making with the community that make them feel safe and supported? The Willow intends to apply to Praxis International to become a blueprint for safety community, and that's a very complicated thing that I'm happy to talk about more if you have questions, but I'm not gonna take time right now to explain. Um, in order to do that, though, we need to show that we have already put some pieces effectively in place. Victim advocates and law enforcement advocacy in the DA's office are a big part of that. Effectively implemented lethality assessments, which I talked about in 2019 and we just saw again here. Um, swift and effective prosecution and wraparound teams to work on high lethality cases are all a part of that prep. The Willow will be applying for a Stop VAWA grant in the next month in hopes of hiring another systems advocate to help coordinate this important work. So we really want to be a part of that solution, and we're going to find the money outside of the community, hopefully, to help coordinate all of that and relieve some of the burden on PD and Sheriff. Your support of our community's growth in this is needed and appreciated. Additional resources in all areas will, be need, will need to be assigned in order to effectively curb the epidemic of domestic violence that affects every neighborhood school and, of course, the victims and their children. We have an amazing team ready to work, and we are excited about the potential in our city to do more and be better for our vulnerable population. Thank you so much for your time. you guys have any questions we are happy to answer those now well thank you all for being here and sounds thank like a lot of work's been done go ahead yeah lots of work on on this as well uh i guess i was just wanting to be sure this is the direction you're going now you're looking for something from us or is this already in, in process this is the direction that we're going now okay, um good. 
we it's there's as Megan said, there's been a lot of hard work going yeah. into this. Um, we're excited to announce it and let you guys know that's where we're heading. Um, the lethality assessment is a really big part of that. It's something that's very important and something we haven't done here. So I'm really excited to get that started. That helps us. There's three questions for the patrol officer that helps us create an assessment of the level of risk that the person who is the victim of domestic violence has. And then we'll follow up with those other questions with uh, the domestic violence detective and the victim witness coordinator to be able to get a better picture, a better idea of predicting future actions to hopefully pre prevent what we saw happen this last summer. And I guess the only other thing I was gonna say is, I heard M Megan talk about how a progress indicator and possibly looking at changing that. I'm certainly open to hearing that and how, how we might make that a better indicator. We're doing that in several areas, but this sounds like one we should look at. Yeah, I agree. And I think getting Megan on board with Tasha uh, and our future domestic violence detective, working together with those experts to determine what that will be. And then we bring that back to you for you guys to evaluate. Thank you. I'm really um, glad to see the um, work being done on various programs, not just straight policing. We've got the mental health issue, we've got domestic violence, we've got numerous caveats there that require special specialty. And I'm really glad to see that we're pursuing those different levels of complex complexity within our um, judicial system. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, it's a holistic approach and we get a much better outcome when we do that. And, uh, you know, police, we're used to, we're problem solvers. So we like to jump in and just do it. But bringing in these experts, people who do it every day, really will make our jobs easier. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you both. Thank you. Thanks. Public comment. Is there any public comment on this item? Is there any public comment online? No, Mayor. Any further discussion? Uh, I would yeah. just say also welcome, Chief Llewellyn. I guess this is your first time in front of us, so thanks for being here. We're happy to have you on board. Yeah, thanks for coming. Chief Law called you old, and you've been around for a long time now. <laughs> yeah, earlier I called him the old rich and the new rich. <laughs> Thank you all again. Um, I want to check on my commissioners. Do you need a 10 minute break? I'm good for another. I'm good. You want to that. get through the first item here? Uh, with that, then we'll move on to our regular agenda item. Number one. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. This is Britt Cromkino, the Student Economic Development Director. Tonight, we have Kevin Wimpy with Gilmore and Bell here to give you an overview presentation of two of our economic development tools, the Tax Increment Financing, or TIP, tool, and the Community Improvement District, or CID, tool. These uh, are both what is being requested from the crossing. The, there is a lot of process involved and going forward. And so we thought we would open it up with kind of an overview or, or an, uh, 101 session, if you will. And then after that, you can consider the resolution which sets the date for the public hearing for this item. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin. Right. Well, good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Kevin Wimpy with Gilmore and Bell, the city's bond council. It's uh, nice to be here with you all again. And I'm joined here tonight uh, by my colleague, Sarah Gunap, uh, also working on this project. Um, so G Gilmore and Bell, you're probably familiar with us as bond council for your regular CIP jacks, general obligation bonds and revenue bonds financing. Uh, streets and infrastructure and so forth, and we certainly do that. Uh, you may be less familiar that we do represent municipalities on economic development projects uh, relating to incentives that sometimes involve bond issues and sometimes don't. Um, you know, star bonds and uh, all the other acronyms you've probably heard of and are, are quite familiar with. Um, obviously, the subject of tonight is tax increment financing and TIF and community improvement districts, which are the uh, you know, related to the crossing uh, application that's been submitted uh, for the West West Campus project. So while while there is um, 
some substance to be discussed at a later date. You'll see in the presentation, uh, there's plenty of hoops to jump through and, and notices and public hearings and so forth to uh, effectuate these incentives uh, should you choose to proceed. And so we do intend for tonight to be more of a procedural roadmap and go over the mechanics of how these work and, and what you might be asked to do in the future uh, should this project proceed. So the first handful of slides uh, deal with TIF. Um, this is really a summary slide where um, you know, TIFs used for a variety of projects. Um, there's really not much limitation on the, the type of use uh, related to a TIF project. And, and the overarching theme is that the uh, growth in assessed valuation that generates greater property taxes and sometimes sales taxes uh, are also captured by TIF are redirected to pay project costs. Uh, and later we'll get into what's eligible, what's not eligible for TIF purposes. But just know it's a redirection of those, uh, that growth in revenues generated within the TIF district. And that last bullet there talks about how revenues can be paid uh, for project costs in two ways. Uh, one is the issuance of bonds. So the, the revenues I just discussed being captured by TIF would be um, you know, securitized and pledged to bondholders who take on the risk of the project repaying that debt. Uh, and second, much more common today is what we call pay-as-you-go or pay-go financing, where the developer fronts all the costs. Typically the developer, sometimes the city or another entity would have uh, costs to be reimbursed. Uh, basically construct the project and then over the TIF period, uh, collect those revenues to be reimbursed for certain eligible costs. Kevin, um, my apologies, but for some reason it's showing up in one place but not the other. I'm wondering if you need to enable editing on the PowerPoint. I'm not sure what's... I just want to make sure the Zoom audience can see what everybody else is seeing. Okay. See the little button just there that says enable editing? Got it. There you go. And then if you want to do the uh, full screen, whoops. Now screen share again, I assume. There we go. Thank you. All right. Okay, this, this slide gets into eligibility on a couple of fronts. So uh, to do TIF financing, you can't just use it anywhere in the city. You have to have an eligible area as defined by the statute. And, and the three common ones are listed there. Um, conservation area, blighted area, and pre-1992 enterprise zones. Uh, the, the enterprise zones are sort of a leftover from an old statute where certain geographic areas were, were deemed eligible and have continued on for being TIF eligible. Uh, blighted areas, um, sort of like it sounds, there's a finding by the governing body that a majority of uh, nine listed factors in the statute exist and therefore the property is blighted and TIF could be used. And conservation area is sort of a uh, semi-related to blight where the property is, is not yet blighted but may become blighted due to the existence of certain factors. And also there's an element of uh, structures existing on the site being 35 years or older. Um, so those are the high-level eligible areas. And then, as I mentioned, only certain costs can be repaid with TIF proceeds. And, and the high ones are, uh, sorry, the key ones are listed there. Um, and really, to keep it straight, in my mind, I always think land acquisition, site work, and horizontal infrastructure are eligible. So really focused on those items in the TIF, uh, TIF Act and mostly public infrastructure. And that vertical construction costs of private buildings uh, are ineligible for TIF financing. This slide just illustrates that within a TIF district, you can have multiple project areas. Uh, and so this shows four different project areas existing within one TIF district. And each project plan or project area has a life, uh, a maximum life under the statute of up to 20 years where those TIF funds can be uh, captured and used to pay uh, those eligible costs or repay bondholders. Okay, some additional key terms here to go over. Uh, base year assessed valuation. So uh, we'll get into a calendar in, a, in another slide or two of sort of the, the milestones or key actions that get taken with, rela with relation to TIF. Uh, but keep in mind that the, the base year is the valuation established on the date the district is created. And then as the project's constructed and, and presumably the, the value increases, uh, that's the metric against which increment grows. So anything above that base year assessed valuation is what gets captured by the property tax TIF. Uh, tax increment is probably a familiar term, but as I just explained, that's what's captured above that base year assessed valuation. Um, and 
key point is that it excludes certain ineligible mills under the statute. And that's 29 and a half mills cannot be captured. 28 of those belong to the school district and one and a half mills are the state's uh, building levy that's uniformly levied across the state. Uh, final term there is TIF fund, and this is simply a separate fund held by the city into which the uh, tax increment or TIF funds are deposited. And, and those funds are trapped in the TIF fund until a TIF plan is adopted and becomes effective. Okay, this is just a really overly simple visual of uh, showing how TIF is, is supposed to work. And, and on the left column there showing pre-construction, uh, you know, the columns just show uh, property tax revenues. And so presumably at the beginning of the project, those are your base year collections on the left, um, showed much much lower than post construction or when the project's complete on the right, uh, showing a lot more tax revenue generated by the project. And you can see in the notes on the right, it, it's really divided into two buckets. Uh, and below the base year assessed valuation, the property taxes allocable to that, um, those remain distributed to the taxing jurisdictions pro rata. So those aren't captured by the TIF. Um, the excluded mill levies I just mentioned, that 29 and a half mills, uh, are also shielded from the TIF and get distributed to those taxing jurisdictions. And then the top bar there shows the increment that is eligible to be captured uh, and can be uh, repay project costs or bondholders. And I'll note here that it doesn't have to be the 100% of the increment is captured. Um, for different projects, you can capture something less than 100% with the remaining balance being distributed to the taxing jurisdictions. Okay, last couple of slides on TIF are really procedural. Um, TIF's a two-step process, um, and we'll lay out a longer calendar on the next slide, but uh, step one's establishment of the TIF district. And again, that freezes the base year assessed valuation and establishes the area in which the TIF uh, will be collected. And, and step two, you'll see we procedurally basically repeat the steps uh, to adopt a TIF project plan. And, and the legal effect of that is that it starts your 20 year statutory clock um, during which you can collect that TIF in the project area. And it permits spending of those TIF funds uh, collected within the city's TIF fund. And here's a little more detail on step one, establishing a TIF district. Uh, again, at the top is the resolution calling the public hearing, which is the action you're being asked to take tonight. Um, and it kicks off a, a lengthy procedure um, you know, at, at its shortest, TIF from beginning to end is four months, five months, usually a little bit longer, uh, depending on how the dates shake out. Um, but again, step one's that resolution. And then to consider establishment of the findings necessary to create a TIF district and then establish that district, uh, the hearing needs to be 30 to 70 days from the adoption of the resolution. And you can see there are uh, there's publication of notice as well as mailed notice to the taxing districts, I'm sorry, taxing jurisdictions, the school district and the county. Uh, and also the property owners within the TIF district. Last bullet there mentions a protest period. So the, the county and school district uh, for TIF established on private property that's subject to ad valorem taxation, those two taxing entities can basically terminate your TIF by um, adopting a resolution directing the city to do so. So they have unilateral ability to shut down that type of TIF district with, within 30 days of that ordinance. And then this slide is step two. You'll notice that the, um, the procedure is almost identical to step one, where a resolution is adopted, notice is provided to other taxing jurisdictions, publication occurs, uh, and then at the end, a public hearing on the TIF plan is held. And that ordinance, um, adopting a TIF plan is a supermajority vote, so it takes two thirds of, of the governing body to pass that. Okay, just got a couple more slides on CID and. Uh, obviously happy to stick around and answer any questions. So switching over to CID here, um, different from TIF where this imposes a new tax within the district, and that can either be the levy of special assessments within the district, or second, a uh, levy of an additional sales tax of up to 2%. So again, not capturing or redirecting existing taxes, but levying new taxes within the district. Um, Unlike TIF, we mentioned those are, uh, revenues are basically only used for horizontal infrastructure, uh, site acquisition, and work under the statute. CID is much broader. Uh, often that's refined by city policy as, as you've done with the city of Lawrence's policy. Uh, and lastly, this process for CID is kicked off by um, submission of a uh, petition to the property owners. 
in here just another graph showing how this uh for sales tax CID, it's a levy of a new tax in addition to what's already levied on sales within the city. And, and so those county, city, and state funds continue to flow through to those taxing jurisdictions. And that additional sales tax is all that's captured for the project. And, and here is the uh, very high level version of, of CID procedure similar to TIF. You can see it's a lot more streamlined, um, much shorter process. And, and there at the end, we provide notice to Department of Revenue which is the state's uh, responsible for collection and distribution of sales tax proceeds. So um, they're notified at the end, assuming a, an ordinance is approved and a sales tax is levied. Okay, that, that's all we have uh, as far as prepared materials, but uh, happy to try to address any questions you might have. Any questions? A minute, go ahead. <laughs> trying to find mine here. The only question I had, and and I can't remember this from the from the statute. When you, I know when you create the the district, you can have the two different areas or whatever. Is that is there a time limit on how long the district can exist before? I mean, could it be thirty years later we come up with a plan, or is there a limit on the the, the age of the entire district? I know it's twenty years for the TIF itself, but right, there's no maximum term for the district itself. the The twenty years applies to the TIF plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. A question, your slide on el eligible areas and eligible costs. Could you go back to that? Sure. Is this the correct yeah, one here? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you've got three areas there that are eligible. Could you explain to me how the crossing fits into one of those? How the I'm sorry, the crossing Cross project project would fit oh, sure. into one of those eligible areas. Right. So the the proposal from the the endowment at the crossing is that it qualifies as a conservation area, and to that end, the endowment team has put together um, the factual basis for that. Um, and again, the, the parameters in the statute are that the majority of the buildings within the area are, uh, more than 50% of the buildings in the area are 35 years or older. And then there are seven factors listed in the statute relating to the status of the site. Um, and there are two of the seven must exist in order for it to be deemed a conservation area. Okay. So there's specific legal criteria. For meeting that standard Th there are i don't i don't have the seven factors oh, right okay. in front of me it, it generally applies to you know deterioration dilapidation uh inadequate infrastructure street layout those types of things okay great. things that arrest the development of the site basically great um and then i have a question for brit if she is she still here of course she's here mm -hmm. yes i'm still here Hi, Britt. <laughs> um question is is it have we evaluated this or, or is this part of the process to evaluate it um, based uh, against our economic development policy that we passed a few years ago? Will it be evaluated against that? Yeah, the, it, it is currently uh, undergoing analysis by a third party consultant. And according to um, state statute, that has to meet uh, a feasibility analysis, which they're conducting. And then also a but four, which is uh, what the city is really wanting. So they will have basically two studies that will come forward. The studies, as I understand them, and Kevin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but each project plan has to have a set of studies. Okay. So will it be evaluated against our actual policy versus state rules? Um, we will evaluate it according to the criteria, the review criteria within our policy. Uh, I'm, we don't evaluate it in terms of a cost benefit analysis. Okay. That's going to basically the financial analysis and the but for analysis being done by the third party consultant covers that. Okay. So as I uh, looked at our policy again, I've read it before, it, I'm trying to figure out where this project falls within our policy, or is that something to be determined through this process? 
Um, yeah, I think that is something that we, we will determine through this process. We'll go through the exact review criteria of our policy that we do for every project. Okay, thank you, Britt. Commissioner Little John, you have any questions? Nope. Uh, Vice Mayor Larson got uh, asked when I was asking about what step this is in the process. So, any other? Uh, let's see if there's any public comment. Doesn't look like there's any in the room. Is there any public comment online? You can raise your digital hand. Uh, no, Mayor. Okay. Your back submission. Mayor, I'm sorry. I, have, I do have one more question. Go ahead. If, you, if you're okay with that. Um, could you tell me, this is called the crossing project. What does it entail? I mean, is it the entire area that we've seen um, layouts of, including the KUIP, the research areas, the daycare center, the the um, residential as well as the commercial, or is it just a piece part of it? Yeah, uh, so Commissioner, the exhibit A to the resolution in your packet shows the uh, overlay, you know, geographic overlay where the TIF district is. Page uh, 19 of 24 on the PDF. Oh, I missed that, I was looking all over for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an odd shape. Yeah. It, and, uh, Sorry about that. I missed it. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I see. Yeah. That. Okay. And th this was drawn and provided by uh, an endowments team, and you know the the shape of of what you're seeing. You know, obviously the core of it is where facilities and their types of uses are going to go. And then you can see on the the southwest and northwest parts there are some some stems, and that's intended that um, they're going to do infrastructure, uh, including you know street improvements. Uh, there's a sewer improvement to the southwest. And the idea is to capture those within the TIF district so that they're eligible costs to be incurred. Okay. So the area that's outlined here, Project Plan 1 and Project Plan 2, uh, are they all taxable property once it's developed? Correct. So right now, my understanding is all of this property is owned by endowment or the university and is not on the tax rolls. And so as the use changes, it will go on the tax rolls as um, uh, taxable uses, and that will be what accrues to that tax increment under the TIF Act. So the area in both plans are going to be taxable property at some point. That That is the plan. Um, and endowment's plan is to be, um, I'll broadly call a horizontal developer, where they install infrastructure and do the site work and then find end users is, is sort of the substance of the plan where they'll lease or sell parcels to end users. And so as parcels become uh, commercially used, uh, they'll be they'll be put on the tax rolls under state statute. So it, it may, may not happen all at once. Project area one comes on the tax rolls. It would be more lot by lot as the use changes. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Anything else? I do have one. I was looking at your schedule. I didn't see where any of these go before our um, public incentive review committee. Um, is that a mistake or is that factual? It, it is included. Uh, I believe it's um, towards the end of this year, maybe first part of next year as we get in what, into the development agreement. And that was an aspect that um, was omitted from the procedural presentation tonight. But the, the development agreement, which, uh, you know, within which will be the business terms of the, the deal, uh, financials and so forth, um, the anticipated date to consider that is the same date as the commission would consider the TIF plan. And so on the same two thirds vote night where you'd be asked to approve a TIF plan under that approval would also be the development agreement. And those terms will start to come together for project area one um, in a couple of months is the plan. Britt mentioned the feasibility analysis and the financial analysis going on now to formulate that business deal. And so when those things come together in a couple of months, that is when city staff scheduled the PERC review. Thank you. And, and I'll just tack on that the, the resolution also calls this public hearing for November 15th. And that was purposely built in a couple of months so that we can have that analysis done by the third party and, and weigh this and really come back with a complete picture for you all to make the decision on that date. Thank you. Any other, anything else? Not this time. Thank you. All right. 
Commissioner, uh, commissioners, I just also wanted to add that included with the package was a um, a fleshed out calendar. I believe it should have been attached, and it has all the steps. And I believe we have this going to Kirk or a Public Incentives Review Committee um, in December. If that helps. This one. It is on there. We yeah, just it. Okay. <laughs> Week of December twelfth. Thank you. Um, I will entertain motions. I would move to adopt resolution number 7447, setting the November 15th, 2022 City Commission meeting as the date and time for a public hearing regarding the establishment of a tax increment financing redevelopment district for the crossing project. Second, can we have some discussion? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Discussion, yeah. Um, so I'm, this is all the prop. This is what I consider the process for going through, and this is what we allow every project to go through. So this is for the, to ensure that we follow the process appropriately. What I want to make sure everybody's clear is that this is not an approval of any sort of incentive. This is just the opportunity to have a public hearing, so the public can weigh in on the actual what I would call the the meat of the the project. Is that my understanding? Okay, that's good. Is that a second? Yep. That's uh, a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes four to zero. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Very kind. Thank um, you. I'll check on my commissioners now. Wouldn't mind. Alone. You need a break? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need a little break. Let's go ahead and uh, come back at eight. Thanks, everyone.
We good? Yes. Welcome back, everyone, to the September 20th, 2022 City Commission meeting. Uh, we will move on to item number two, consider approving a comprehensive plan amendment to Plan 2040, Chapter 8B. And I think I see Sandra Day. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioner Sandy Day, Planning Office. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. It's, sound sounds off on my end. This item is a comprehensive plan amendment. It was considered by the Planning Commission at their January meeting, and it was included with a request for also annexation and rezoning. Um, as we moved through the process, uh, the applicant ended up um, withdrawing the annexation and zoning requests, but did request that the comprehensive plan amendment continue to this body. The plan amendment affects um, the K-10 and Farmers Turnpike plan and specifically property that is located on the west side of E-902 Road as it's extended to the north. So that is um, just a bit north of um, the Rock Chalk Park property. The plan currently designates this property as appropriate for residential and office use or a, a medium density residential component with an office component. So that is where the mixed use piece comes in. The developer had requested an application for development of single family residential zoning and that corresponding rezoning was also for a medium density residential zone. In order to move through with the project, um, a comprehensive plan amendment was required. The item comes to you with a recommendation from the Planning Commission 6 to 4. Um, so this was not a unanimous vote and it is reflective of the Planning Commission's um, discussions about the appropriateness of a number of different components of annexation and development as well as the comprehensive plan. Um, staff's recommendation was for approval of that comprehensive plan amendment to move this land use to um, a single use or a multifamily, a medium density multifamily, I'm sorry, medium density residential development land use category as part of the K-10 and Farmers Turnpike plan. And you can see maps of this within the staff report on page two that highlights or outlines that property and then um, also with what the recommended land use would be later in that staff report. Um, one of the concerns the Planning Commission identified was the fact that we were looking at just a small area within the overall comprehensive plan. Um, the K-10 and Farmers Turn Plan is part of the city's future work plan to do an update on that. Um, that is tentatively on the planning's work schedule for next year um, following the completion of the West of K-10 plan, which we have initiated and it is ongoing, but is still in the very early stages of that. Um, and that is one of the balances that we work with where a development application comes in. Um, it's maybe not necessarily timed with what the work plan is for a particular planning area, um, but the the overall analysis of the comprehensive plan request, staff's conclusion was that the proposed use um, to really remove the office component of the residential mixed use character that was originally identified in that comprehensive plan um, was, was appropriate given its location its adjacency to designated open space, which also corresponds with designated floodplain areas that would be protected and preserved through open space. Um, at this time, the only item related to that original development package is just the comprehensive plan amendment. As I mentioned, the annexation and the zoning were withdrawn by the application by the applicant, and it is just this item that is coming forward to you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? All right, just a minute. Nope. Uh, she, she already, Sandra jumped and gun for me. Thank you, Sandra, for your presentation about, because I was curious that uh, if the, this plan would be revisited since we're making or considering this amendment. So I don't have anything other than that. 
So if I can follow up on that, are, are you saying, Sandra, even though they are already going to work on this, this area will be included in 2023? If we change this amendment, it would not be revisited or it would be included in what would be revisited? Sandy Day Planning Office. That's a that's a good clarification. Yes, this would all be revisited in totality within the boundary of the plan. But as we looked in the context of this one small specific area, um, the conclusion was that the proposed change was reasonable. Are there any public comments? <laughs> Are there any public comments online? No, Mayor. Okay. Um, I, 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 in terms of discussion, just bounce it off of you all. I was concerned that this doesn't really maximize the amount of units that could be developed there. That was a concern when I watched that uh, planning commission meeting. Um, I, I still have that concern. Um, it's my way of discussion. I guess I thought, yeah, that be residential office would, if it's medium, it's single or medium density, so it actually could be higher than residential office. Sandy, am I correct on that? Yeah. RSO is something like 15, and all M is 20 something. Sandy Day Planning Office. So there are a variety of um, zoning districts that could be applied. The comprehensive plan really speaks to the, the bigger, higher level idea or concept of what the land use would be. Medium density residential and office when it's combined, such as the RO, um, they have kind of comparable residential components. So medium density is anywhere seven to 15 or so dwelling units per acre. Um, when you add in the mixed use, the office component, you actually remove um, some of that residential opportunity. Um, how we look at getting the actual specificity into a development, um, maximizing that development comes with actually the zoning and uh, more specifically with the subdivision plat where we really can fine tune how many lots you're getting in there. So for instance, if a property were to be rezoned to RS5, which can either be medium or low density, depending on how that property is subdivided, you can get more lots or fewer lots, depending on what that minimum lot size is within that. So really what the comprehensive plan amendment is doing is articulating an aspiration of how that area would be developed. Does that help? Well, no, the mayor asked the question, but. but. Yeah, I have, so in we've spoken for many years at great length about how mixed use is good for a number of reasons. Why would we remove it then from the first large area we might actually be able to develop? Sandy Day Planning Office, that is something that, that staff kind of considered as well. And this is a very interesting and unique time um, within the community because we are revisiting the land development code. Um, so depending on what comes out of the land development code and what those districts look like in the future, that's not necessarily excluding mixed use opportunities. Um, whether or not that mixed use is residential and non-residential or if, or if that mixed use is some kind of um, structure within the residential categories. So some detached, some attached, um, some uh, top bottom duplex, some um, row housing. So that's another um, type of mixed use, but it's it's within the residential component rather than having um, residential and non-residential. So one of the things that we know about this area is we do have some um, transportation limitations. And that was one of the things that we were kind of grappling with um, as we looked through some of the other development components, 
um, that's a bigger picture question to to look at with a larger revisit of the comprehensive plan um, when we get to looking at the total plan. Um, and, and it did sort of make us wonder um, about the appropriateness of some of those non-residential um, components. Now it could be and this would be the case today that if there were a planned unit development, a planned development code today allows for within a planned development to have a limited amount of non-residential uses within that planned development. So where the comprehensive plan <laughs> merges with actually the land development code, um, those are really um, finite details that we, we can't really answer today. Um, this is really looking at that, like I said, um, much higher level. So I don't know that necessarily changing the land use category, um, it, taking out the, that office term, I, I think there are still opportunities for some mixed use development within there. And we may come back and further refine this when we look at the K-10 and Farmers Turnpike plan as well. So. I guess probably my thought process, and, and it's in the staff report, and Sandy mentioned it. I think I was actually on the planning commission when this K-10 former Turnpike plan was developed. And, you know, one of the thoughts was, oh, you're right along K-10, that'd be a great place for some office, you know. But then when you actually look at those those lots, it's really hard to get to. Like, who? I mean, you know, it's really back there, and then you have the, the uh, you have the, Westall plant, and then you have that 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 other easement with not very good roads. I mean, I can't see anyone wanting to build an office that far off any major street. It seems like a much better place for residential. And again, that was mentioned in in the report that I think on the map it looks kind of good. Like, hey, you might as well have office along the the turnpike. I mean, along K10. But in reality, I think the access to that area has um, changed it. So. I'd go ahead and support this. I, I am glad we're looking at the whole plan. I mean, we did this 12 years ago and it's, the world's a lot different <laughs> both before or after. And I, I think the whole K-10 farmer turnpike plan needs to be looked at again in light of our new development code as it comes and in light of um, Panasonic and, you know, transportation and so forth. So there's a lot to look at in that plan. So then why the necessity to make this change now? Um, I don't know if it's necessary, but you know the 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 there has been a request for that. The, the the planning commission approved it, and I don't see a reason not to do it because I think that would ultimately be it's going to be some sort of medium, um, you know, medium residential is what makes sense up there against the turnpike, and that's what they're asking for is medium residential. And, and whatever comes forward will, will have to come with a zone, a plan, a zoning, an annexation. So, um, but I think sending the message that this was a good place for medium residentials, a better message than saying we as a city wants this to be office, because I just don't see it being an office. So that's why now. Um, we didn't, they talked about it a little bit, um, but the, that it is not in the Lawrence School District. Did you guys have any thoughts about that? It's a reality we're going to face a lot more is the fact that we're going to be developing that Northwest where they're, it's not in our school district. There's nothing we can change about that. Well, I don't know that to be the case. <laughs> as as I just don't know that anyone's ever asked you know, um, what the process or, or changing school districts. Yeah, I don't, I've, I've had many people ask me and, and some quite adamant that that is something that could be addressed, but would take a great deal of energy um, and cooperation with our partners. With uh, the other school districts. Yeah. And the legislature. And the legislature. Right. <laughs> so. Um, Lord, I think that's something. Yeah, that's a. Yeah, important. it's a. Uh, I just wanted to quickly say that I would be in support of it too, because it still gives the capability of not necessarily the work live uh, office act aspect of it, but still a, a 
version of mixed use where we could have duplexes and single family homes and other types of homes within that area. So um, that way we can figure out a way towards density if that's something we choose or, you know, or if not, but it still gives us that option. I'm supportive of the plan as it is. I think there's gonna to continue to be a lot more discussion about the whole area. You wanna make a motion then? Um, I will. This is item two, uh, approved comprehensive plan amendment CPA 21-00379. Second. I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes four to zero. It'll be fun to see what it actually turns out to be. There's always that. That brings us to number three, receive water, wastewater revised rate scenario number two and provide direction and staff preparation of 2023-2025 rate ordinance. Hi, Commission. Uh, my name is Angela Buzzard and I'm um, General Manager of Administration with our MSO department. Um, so myself and Colin Dratt with Rock Tellus will be presenting for you tonight. So um, give me one second and I will get a screen shared here and get us kicked off. <clears throat> Just one second. So, share quickly. And um, are we seeing the first slide there? Hopefully. Yes. Great. So, um, thank you again for having uh, this uh, presentation with the group. Um, the components we'll be going over actually um, and looking at the revision since we last talk will be, be fairly brief between Colin and myself and leave opportunity for dialogue. Um, so as we, just as a reminder here on this first slide, when we last spoke on August 9th, uh, there was some direction from the commission that we were to come back with revised uh, revisions to scenario number two. And so we've been able to do that. Um, so the majority of this will focus on that, but just as a little bit of a recap, as we go forward, um, if we recall, uh, we talked a little bit that night, which is over a month ago. So just as a reminder, um, we talked about the investments we were making in the system of about seven to eight percent um, for the since about 2013, uh, funding our CIP program, really an effort to try to reduce sewer backups and reduce inflow and infiltration from stormwater into our wastewater system, as well as reduce service interruptions to our customers from water line breaks. Um, lowering our preventative maintenance costs um, by being more proactive in preventative maintenance, as well as looking at environmental stewardship aspects within the system. We also highlighted a number of the projects that we're working on related to um, water and wastewater, a lot of it being within our maintenance programs um, that we have um, lots of a variety of maintenance programs throughout the water and wastewater system, a lot of it focusing on inflow and infiltration. Also working to relocate our utilities as a part of our capital improvement projects, particularly our road projects. And then obviously there's some significant budget um, requirements for our regulatory mandates, particularly the Kansas River wastewater treatment plant upgrades. And then we also talked a bit about the capacity and growth projects that we'll have as the community continues to grow um, in different directions, particularly looking at the West and Southwest in the early projects. We also provided um, just a recap of the strategic plan, strategic plan uh, indicators that are driving um, the decisions that we're making as well. We are making positive strides in some of our indicators, but have a ways to go in others. And we feel like the rates plans that we're putting forward is trying to move the, um, the needles on those areas that we need to still make progress on. So um, this year, unlike some others, is a little bit different. We talked about the key variable factors that are driving uh, the cost um, and revenue factors within the rate model. Um, obviously, a lot of infrastructure repair, personnel costs um, are, are traditional. However, we were seeing and are seeing higher energy and chemical costs, 
um, as well as specific cost escalations to projects, um, particularly in materials, and then general inflation factors that's influencing a lot of the costs within our water and wastewater systems. Um, as a part of, so that was kind of a recap. The feedback that we got from the commission that we have now implemented with the revised rates, um, this list looks familiar to you, um, but it is it is omitting the one project at the request of the commission, which was about $8 million, $8.1 million for the Clinton um, water treatment plant taste and odor project. So that was omitted from this. So our total, we're calling previously unfunded CIP projects is about, you know, almost $32 million, about $31.8 million has been included in the revised scenario number two per for the direction from the commission. In addition, the additional direction was to provide sustainability funds for three of our capital improvement projects. Um, and so just as a reminder, um, those are looking at renewable energy infrastructure. We can look at alternative disinfection. We will also be evaluating ways to lay over our green rating system uh, to those projects as well. So in incorporating sustainability components in the three projects that were identified, which were the field operations campus, we were able to incorporate 4.7 million into that. The Kansas River wastewater treatment plant upgrade is 3 million. And then the third program was our vehicle replacement program. And we were able to include $400,000 in that program. So the total sustainability funding um, was about 8.1 million. We had to do some moving around. It wasn't direct um, dollar for dollar from the um, water treatment plant taste and odor project that we removed because it was the timing of the funding, but we're able to make adjustments in the timing of different projects to be able to put the sustainability funding right a little over $8 million in this. So I'm going to, um, and to say that the direction of the commission was also to keep rates where they were at or lower from scenario two. So we were able to make these accommodations to the CIP and sustainability additions um, from direction from the commission and make some adjustments to scenario two. And then obviously we've provided two other scenarios for consideration tonight as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Colin for the next few slides to talk about uh, the rate um, scenarios in, in detail. Sure, thanks. Uh, Colin Dratt with Raptelis. Um, can y'all hear me okay? Yeah, okay. thank like you. Um, so we'll start with revised rate scenario two, which was really what we were tasked with, with bringing back. We have some alternatives to that, um, just for your consideration for information. Um, but, you know, scenario two includes, you know, all of the operating expenses that were presented in the city manager's budget. Um, Angela noted those uh, previously unfunded projects, excluding the one um, that uh, we kind of opted to pull out as well as the additional sustainability funding. And basically what we've been able to do um, between those adjustments and just the finalization of the budget and, and, and all of the numbers and the projections, um, we were able to um, kind of make some tweaks to that multi-year plan. Um, so at this point, you know, for, for the multi-year plan and, and the staff recommendation, it would be the 8.75, the 10 and a quarter and 11%. Go to the next slide. And I would I would just oh, sure. remind, um, just as a reminder, the previous scenario two was again 875 was there. It was 10.5 and it was 12% in 2025. Um, just as a reminder to where we were August 9th. Right. And basically the changes impacted those um second and third years more so than the than the first year. Uh, but it, we were able to bring those second and third um your increases down based on these changes. Okay. So another option is to do things in a level fashion. Um, so rather than ramping up and ultimately needing higher adjustments toward the end to essentially sort of pay for the, the lower adjustment at the at the beginning, what we could do is we could we could spread it out and make it more level. Now this is a little more consistent with what we've done in the past, trying to look at equal annual increases um, and, and make things a little more level, but it does have um, a higher impact up front, but over the period generates about the same amount of revenue as the kind of ramp in plan. And then another option, and those first two, we were really looking at it as kind of multi-year plans. The other option would be to just 
make an adjustment this year. Um, and again, this includes all the same expenses and the same revenue requirement for CIP and sustainability. And basically what we were looking at is if we were just gonna do a one-year adjustment, uh, we felt more comfortable kind of sticking with um, our, our prior annual rate modeling process, which really looked at each year individually. So if you think about the, the plan where we do the 8.75 as the lower first year, it's kind of like a, a package deal to get back up to where we need to be in years two and three. Um, so if we reduce that first one, um, but kind of had that in, in place along with the second and third, um, we, were, we felt pretty good about that multi-year plan. If we were only gonna do one year, um, might be preferable to uh, to go ahead and, and, and do what we, we think we would normally do for the one year. Um, so that's that's 10% for, for just the one year. Thank you, Colin. Yep. Um, so really just to round this out and, and go to questions is that um, we're really looking for direction from the commission for us to go ahead and draft the water and wastewater rate ordinance that we would that we would be bringing back later this fall. So that that's the action that we're looking tonight is um, what rate increases um, you are comfortable with and would like us to move forward with. And then the next steps again, just as a reminder, we'll present the water and wastewater rate ordinance um, for consideration this fall. We'll, we'll probably do it with the solid waste and stormwater rate ordinances once we have your feedback on those as well. Um, in in enough time for our billing department to be able to have time to implement those changes. Uh, these rate increases would be planned to go into effect in, in January 1st. Uh, we will also be presenting system development charges. Um, those are on a five-year cycle. This is the last year of our cycle, so we need to get those in front of you as well. Um, we're really just trying to get the lift of the um, rate in the rate projections off our plate, and then we can focus on the SDCs and bring that back for you here the next month or two for consideration as well. So with that, I will um, oops, sorry, turn it back over to um, Thank you for your time. I'll also mention um, our entire team is here, um, Melinda and Mike and others, if there's questions on the operational side as well. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I guess I have a couple questions. Um, first, there was a, um, a speaker earlier who talked about the, the increase um, both in the um, surplus for one year and the, the, the surplus total um, or the total savings. Can someone address that and, and why that's being proposed at the same time as, as an increase? Jeremy Wellman, Finance Director. Uh, you all will, will recall from our budget discussions that <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a certain amount of cash that has to be set aside um, to satisfy our bond covenants, um, and so the uh, 2023 budget was projected um, with the 1.25 necessary for the debt reserve um, for the bond covenants, and also uh, to satisfy the fund balance policy that you all adopted last year. So, because we're in theory spending more money, we have to have more in the fund balance. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, what does the the rising interest rates do as we continue to see rising interest rates, the idea of bonding some of these projects and how does that affect our CIP, CIP and our, what we project our ability is to fund that? I know many of which were gonna be bonds. Jeremy Well, the finance director. Um, yes, so the interest rate is starting to, to creep up, but uh, borrowing costs are still uh, considerably lower than they have been uh, in the past 10 years. Um, we'll continue to analyze that, um, but as uh, you know, the city has uh, placed a uh, emphasis on making sure that the ratepayers that are paying for the improvements are also the ratepayers that are getting the benefit of said improvements. Um, trying to convert to a cash-funded CIP, um, I think, would be detrimental because no. yeah. I wasn't uh, suggesting that. <laughs> would be, you know, we'd be storing up even more cash and then going for these large projects. So unfortunately we are beholden to uh, the bond market. Uh, we have the second best bond rating uh, available to us, uh, which keeps our, our borrowing costs um, 
almost as low as possible. Obviously, if we had the highest bond rating, it could be a little bit lower. Um, but I believe it's a negligible difference uh, between where we are uh, and what the top rating uh, could net us. Um, but I would say that in the five-year plan, um, you know, we've anticipated an, an increase in interest uh, to ensure that this rate model would support uh, those increased uh, interest costs. And again, the, the amount of money we have in savings affects that bond rating, correct? Jeremy Willen, finance director, absolutely. Uh, should the city start to spend down um, the, the savings, uh, we can't go below what we told the bondholders we would hold. Uh, that's non-negotiable. Um, but should we spend it down between where we are today and, and what that uh, 1.25 would look like, uh, we would start to see uh, Moody's, our rating agency, get very concerned about our ability to cash uh, fund the debt service going forward. Um, they would probably rate us, uh, you know, they would start dropping our rate um, with each um, future rating analysis that they do. Um, we are currently con on a going concern, uh, which means if they, if our financial conditions were to worsen, they would lower us from the rating we're at uh, down at least one grade, if not more, uh, just based on the severity of whatever that uh, decline is. But um, you can, uh, we've got all of our ratings uh, from Moody's on our website. You can read them all. Uh, and every single one of them for the last 10 years has said cash is king. So should the city start to see a, a decline in its ability to um, reserve that cash uh, for the bondholders, then uh, we most assuredly would see a rating increase or rating decrease, which would increase our interest rate. Got a question on um, with all these new projects that we are putting in there, how does that impact our bonding capacity? Or how close are we to that ceiling? Jeremy Wilma, finance director. So the ceiling is on the uh, general obligation side, 30% of assessed valuation. Um, I have not done the analysis to see what those uh, minor changes were, um, but at the, the last time we reported on this, we were at less than 30% of that cap. So we had about 70% of the valuation uh, available to us. So on the general obligation side, um, the state mandate that you only spend 30% assessed valuation is not a, a concern for the city of Lawrence. Um, on the revenue bond side, there is no cap on the amount of debt that can be issued. That cap is more self-imposed based on our rate model. Um, and so what I would say is that uh, the 2023 through 2027 CIP that you all have adopted uh, was plugged into this rate model and the rates that are being recommended tonight support that plan. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Any other questions? Mr. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Jeremy, I had a question for you. Um, uh, thank you uh, also, Angela, for presenting this. Um, in terms of our bond rating, uh, if we, I, I would assume as well, given all the information that you gave uh, Commissioner Finkelvai and Vice Mayor Larson, that if we went with the three-year plan, it would be looked on, looked upon a lot more favorably and uh, present a, a measure of stability, I would think. Um, and, uh, in the second one, my second part of my question is, um, with scenario two as well, I did, I, I thought I saw a little component down at the bottom. It does look like there is an opportunity to go ahead and change that somewhere down the line or, um, adjust it somewhere down the line. I just want to make sure. Yes, so I, Finance Director, sorry. Um, to the first part of your question, uh, Commissioner Littlejohn, um, yes, I believe Moody's would look favorably on a three-year rate uh, as that would essentially lock in um, um, rates for the next three years, which would take some of the volatility of the rate setting process out. Um, having said that, though, you know, we also run the risk of if those rates aren't high enough, um, you know, that, that can create a problem um, in terms of tackling inflation. You know, if inflation continues to 
uh, escalate at the level that it's currently escalating, uh, these rates that are being presented tonight may not be sufficient to cover uh, the debt service requirement, at which point we'd have to come back and ask for a uh, amendment to the rate. Um, you know, that's highly subjective and, and I'm not recommending, or I'm not, you know, saying that is absolutely going to happen. Uh, but that is just one concern, uh, you know, that um, that we have just given the volatility of the marketplace where it is right now. Um, if things were more predictable, uh, I, I think we'd probably, you, you know, all feel better about saying in a predictable environment, we can produce, you know, a predictable return. Um, but that, you know, the the three years, if we were to, uh, if you all were to approve that, um, we just have to be prepared for the fact that should costs go up, um, you know, we'll either have to trim uh, operating expenditures in the budget, uh, or we'll have to ask for a rate increase to, to make sure that we're satisfying our debt uh, covenants. Angela Buzzard, yeah. General Manager of Administration. To your second question, which um, Jeremy touched on a little bit. Uh, so yes, the three-year rate adoption does not preclude at all um, coming back next year and making additional changes, just like uh, Jeremy's saying, whether the need to go up. Obviously, in a best-case best, best case scenario, staff uh, plans to revisit this uh, next year to look at costs and you know, would be the opportunity for us to even look at, you know, if the economy, if there could be decreased opportunities as well. So it really just depends on what, what the market does and, and costs um, for these larger projects that we have, what we see, and, and we'll be monitoring that. So um, yeah, I think best case scenario staff recommendation in our thought process was to look at this and, and maybe, you know, the full rate increase isn't needed or, or maybe it is, but um, at least right now, with the assumptions that we're making based on the number of multitude of factors that Raftelis puts into this modeling, this is the best we can do with the information that we have right now. One more question, Mayor. It's okay. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the factors for these rates that you considered was the, the rate of inflation, which has been pretty significant of late. If we start to see a, a significant decrease in inflation over, over the next year, will that uh, um, maybe give us some cushion to reevaluate and lower those rates based on that factor? Jeremy, I'll, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll start and then you all can chime in. Um, yes, I would say that uh, as we see costs start to decline, that obviously would provide a, um, a buffer from what we're anticipating in our budget versus what we would actually see. Um, whether or not, you know, that would be a significant enough adjustment to, to then lower rates, you know, time will tell. We'll just have to see uh, what happens with the market. Um, the likelihood that our costs, you know, go back down to what they were pre-pandemic levels in one year, I think may be um, wishful thinking, hopefully not. But um, what we may see is instead of, you know, double digit inflation, it's down to single digit, but that's still a, a factor that, that we're going to have to keep an eye on. So, um, you know, to, to try to answer your question as best I can, I would say certainly if we see our costs start to come down uh, to a level that we're comfortable, we can still meet our obligations, uh, a rate reduction could be considered. Um, but, but I think we'd have to see a pretty significant uh, shift downward in, in the costs that we've seen over the last 18 months. Thank you, Jeremy. Anything else? Let's see if there's any public comment. It just sounds like a lot of, is this on? Hello? Didn't sound like it's on. Um, it just sounds like a lot more tax dollars. I mean, if they're going to keep raising the water 10% even more, I don't remember my water bill going up every single year. You know, I'm over 50 and I don't remember that happening. So, and it's not pre-pandemic, it's pre-Biden administration. And if you're putting any fluoride in the water, you can stop doing that and save us money because some of us don't want that also. I don't know if you are. I would like to know, but that's all. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? 
Are there any online comments? No, Mayor. <clears throat> Um, I did want to make sure I see Mike Lawless and, and Melinda Harger on here. I just want to make sure they didn't have anything they wanted to say. Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. Can you answer the question about whether or not we put fluoride in the water? Yeah. For our... <laughs> sure, Mike Lawless, Deputy Director um, for Municipal Services and Operations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, we do add fluoride. Um, to our treatment process, um, but at times that is only to supplement what is naturally in the in the water that we get. Um, it is it's not a large expenditure for fluoride. It's it's one of the cheaper um, chemicals that we add. Um, in past years, it was under about ten thousand a year for um, fluoride addition. It may be a little bit higher this year. We've had some. Um, supply chain issues. Um, and honestly, I, I don't remember the last cost that I saw um, on the order for um, fluoride. I would add, just um, add a little bit to um, what the commenter said. It's, it's my understanding when, when we first started looking at utility rates when I was early in the commission that one of the reasons we needed to really seriously reevaluate how we, um, uh, how the rates were, were calculated was the fact that we weren't um, historically, keep our rates were not keeping up with the cost. So we're behind. So we're trying to make sure that we catch up so we don't get into the situation like we've been previously. So unfortunately, we're seeing that now, that um, we've got to get those rates up in order to address the issues that, I don't want to say, yeah, just to address issues that um, we've kind of put off um, over the years, which is unfortunate, but we've got to do it. Otherwise, we're going to have a system that, you know, potential failures, and we, we're already in, in a situation where we have some emergency projects we're having to do that cost a lot more. Um, and we want to get that to where we're not spending money like that. So, Mike Wallace, other? Deputy oh. Director. Sorry, um, I, I was just going to, uh, Deputy Director for MSO, I was just going to uh, add a little bit to what uh, Commissioner or Vice Mayor Larson had to say. Um, I actually saw um, an article today that said, you know, in the past, um, it had been about how everybody was touting that rates had not been raised and and we start to see the effect of of not taking care of our systems if you if you look at the news there's um, Jackson Mississippi Flint Michigan um, there's a multitude of examples that we can point to that if we don't take care of our system and it, it is an aging infrastructure and we have to keep investing in that infrastructure um, to maintain it and make sure it's there and it's operational so that we can supply um, the water and sewer service um, that we need for the customers that we have. And, and we don't wanna get into a situation where um, we, uh, we become a, a, a Jackson, Mississippi or a, a Flint, Michigan. Any other comments, discussion? Make a motion. Ready? Well, that would just provide <laughs> direction. <clears throat> Pardon me, Sherry. Sorry. Did um, we do online? Do you don't have a motion on this yeah. item? Correct. We're, we're giving them direction. Oh, just direction. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I would jump yes, in first. Then um, I would say go with uh, scenario number two, the first one. Um, I, I think it uh, provides a large amount of flexibility and. Um, includes all the things that we asked for. I, I thank you guys for finding a way to lower the rates in the um, second and third year. I really appreciate that. So uh, that would be that would be my opinion. I would concur with Commissioner Little John. I still prefer a one-year rate because I think we have so many variables out there, but 
I see where you guys are coming from, but I would like to see just a one year rate. The 8.75. Yes. Not the 10. Every year. But it's something that we can revisit next year. And the three year rate helps us, well, my understanding is with Moody's, which is key when we start doing bonding and so forth. Yes, I, I understand that argument. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd rather kind of lock that in, but at the same time, we know we can revisit it next year to see where we're at with inflation, with all other, other um, variables counted in. We would revisit this every year regardless, wouldn't we? Have to set these rates every year? Yes, I think, right, even if we adopted a three-year model, someone can confirm we mm -hmm. still have a v vote every year, correct? <laughs> It's up to the individual commission decision, but um, Angela Buzzard, General Manager of Administration, MSO, uh, it, it's common practice for municipalities to also adopt a multi-year rate structure and not to hold, um, you know, over those those three-year rates as well. So, but I think you know staff is recommending with the volatility of things in the in the market and in the economy that we would be looking at at bringing it back and and revisiting our cost and revenue assumptions next year as well. Any further discussion? No, I, I think I've said what I agree with. So the next step is to bring back a resolution, right? Okay. Correct. So we just need direction on preparing the language of the resolution. Well, I'm hearing consensus on the 8.75. Um, I, I do hear one commissioner un, insecure about adopting three years. Um, again, we have to revisit it every year anyway, so um, I'm not as bothered by that as long as it comes before the commission and the public. So, so I'm hearing we're going to prepare the ordinance with the three um, rate scenario number two for consideration for the commission, correct? Yes, revised okay. scenario number two. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Next, we are um, deferring item number four and moving on to item number five. Hello, um, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, last week, we provided a brief history of our current meeting procedures. Sorry, Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. Um, we also provided some information on um, how some of our peer cities manage their meetings and a draft resolution. At that meeting, the commission provided direction to bring back the draft resolution with recommendations on general public comment, decorum language, and the consent agenda. Um, so we'll, um, I'll start off with talking a little bit about uh, general public comment. Um, so based on last week's discussion, the draft resolution has been updated to include um, a requirement to sign up in advance uh, for the general public comment section of the agenda. This only applies to that portion of the agenda, so it would not, you would not be required to sign up in advance for regular agenda items. It also has a 30 minute cap uh, for the general public comment section. Um, 
there was a lot of discussion from the commission about possibly setting a specific time that other items on the agenda would start. Um, at this time, um, oh, I'm sorry, there was, uh, before we get to that, there was conversation about moving it to the beginning of the meeting. Um, so we will update the agenda template accordingly, uh, but we do not recommend including that in the resolution. It doesn't need to be, and it gives you flexibility in case we find that that's, you know, uh, not working for us and we want to move that section to another place on the agenda. Um, there was just a lot of discussion about stating specific start times for other items on the agenda. Um, we are not recommending that at this time based on some factors. Um, one is we looked at the average length of general public comment, and we found that the majority of cases, it's um, under that 30 minutes and in many cases well under. So if we are looking at efficiency, waiting for a specific time to start other items really wouldn't support that. Um, and that would apply to other items on the agenda as well. Um, any, if we stated a specific time that any portion of our agenda would start, we would in many cases be uh, stagnant during that time. And again, if the purpose is for increasing efficiency, we really don't recommend that. Um, we do think that this adding that cap will still provide some level of predictability for the public. Um, with a cap, they understand that they're not going to be waiting more than 30 minutes for any meeting before the regular agenda items to start. So we'll move on to our next item. Um, there was some conversation from the commission about looking at additional decorum language. Um, so what we are um, looked at um, in con consultation with the city attorney's office, we looked at other cities and they felt comfortable adding um, this additional language to what we already have. So it would say members of the public are encouraged to act with decorum and to address the governing body and each other with respect. Uh, we will add the following will not be tolerated, uttering fighting words, slander, speeches invasive of the privacy of individuals, unreasonably loud or repetitious speech, and speech is so disruptive of the proceedings that the business of the city is substantially interrupted. The remainder was already in um, our resolution. Uh, it shall be the duty of the presiding officer to preserve order and decorum. Any member of the public engaging in disruptive behavior that interferes with the governing body's ability to conduct the business of the city may, after a warning, be subject to removal from the meeting. And again, um, Randy reviewed that and was comfortable with it. It's a fair statement of constitutional rights, that language that we added. Um, regarding the consent agenda, another item we had a fair amount of conversation on, or you all did. Um, so um, we also on consent agenda looked at meetings since 2019 and consent items were pulled at a majority of the meetings, um, in many cases, more than one item. Um, a lot, all of those items that were pulled since 2019, um, unless we missed one or two, but we did a pretty extensive search, were approved with some of them and very few compared to the overall being deferred. And again, the majority of those were then approved at the next meeting. A large majority of those were pulled for conversation around items, uh, around comments that were submitted, um, but also discussed during the meeting, but they were submitted in writing. Um, so to um, increase meeting efficiency while still allowing for public input on these items, um, we're proposing again, um, updating the, what we had presented last week, updating the agenda template to include a separate consent agenda for items that require a public hearing. Um, the reasons for that is the public will still be allowed to submit written comments to be included in the agenda packet um, and or communicate directly with commissioners. Um, commissioners would obviously still be able to pull any items on the consent. Um, so if there was comments or questions that came in that they wanted staff to respond to, they could pull that item, have staff respond, and then um, uh, vote on that item. Again, those if they were pulled, they still wouldn't be subject to public comment except for any written comment that you all received. Um, 
And then um, commissioners would also be able to request an item, which you currently can do under um, approval of the agenda. Um, if there was an item that you wanted to have public discussion on or felt strongly that it needed, then it would be moved to the regular agenda. And in that case, it would be subject to public comment. And again, written public comment would continue to be allowed on any items. Uh, the language that was in last week didn't change because it, it allows, um, ascend, it, it states that um, may, items may be identified as not being eligible for public comment. So it gives you that flexibility and it would just be an agenda template change with guidance on the agenda. Um, I did want to um, go ahead and just um, add that, um, you know, we've added the virtual option um, so individuals can participate and sign up and provide public comment via Zoom. So some of those things add a little bit of time to our meetings. Um, I, I think it's sort of maybe not the best terminology, but the length of our meetings when we're looking at all of these, it's not any one item. It's sort of um, death by a thousand cuts when, when we're adding options. So even though um, these might be be minor changes, I do think at, at, they add up to to considerable time. So even these slight adjustments, I think over time will make a make a difference for how late these meetings are going. Um, there was some public comment regarding. Um, order of the agenda. Um, I um, Obviously, we have lots of options in how we arrange things, and we can change those at any time. Um, one concern I would have if we move public comment to the end is that we do have an end time for meetings um, set at 11 o'clock. And if it was at the end and week after week we were deferring that, um, I think that would be a concern. So if that's something you're interested in, we should probably remove that end time for meetings. Um, moving consent agenda to the end, um, many of our consent items are things like claims and licenses and appointments. And again, if we move that near the end of the meeting and we reach that 11 o'clock time, there would be concerns with not getting to approving those items. <clears throat> and then um, I think that's it. That's all I had. And I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Commissioner Littlejohn? Uh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to uh, confirm that the 30-minute uh, cap is just for general public comment. People will still be able to comment um, uh, regarding agenda items and on uh, select uh, consent agenda items, correct? So as it's written, the cap would just be on the general public comment portion of the meeting. The consent agenda, um, again, the resolution gives you the, the flexibility. What we're suggesting is that on the consent agenda, you would have two separate consent agendas. And the second one would only commissioners would be able to pull those items. The second, the other consent agenda would be for public hearing items that require um, a public hearing and the um, public would be able to pull those items. But there's no other cap on any public comment section except for general public comment. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's kind of what I was wanting to make sure that was out there. Any other questions? Yeah. I'll wait for Sherry to. Public comment. My name is Dr. Justin Spies. I'm running for Douglas County Commissioner in District 1 as a Republican candidate. So I Did I hear that right? So typically the comments don't even last, last 30 minutes total? Like why, why are you imposing this cap? I mean, it's clear you're trying to shut us down. You're trying to, trying to censor us. So to the, and, and so 
Lawrence Times tried to say that uh, this is all about a streamlining process. You guys have been talking about it being streamlined. Well, two weeks ago when this first came up on the uh, on the agenda, me and my group, we came here and we spoke here. We left this meeting, went to the GOP meeting here in Douglas County. I spoke there. We attended the meeting. We left there. We were hungry. We went over to Wayne and Larry's. They had a fire so they couldn't serve us. So we went over to another restaurant. We ate dinner. And we came back here. The meeting was still going on. You hadn't even gotten to that agenda item for us to speak on. And in fact, you didn't even get to it that night. You had to postpone it. And then so tonight, so same thing. We come in here. We speak. We, we left here. Me and my friend, we left here. We went and ate dinner. And we come back. And we're still here to speak. The streamlining isn't us. It's you guys. And let me give you an example of what I mean. So Bart Littlejohn just asked a question that I just go, hey, man, can you read? Everyone knows that this was strictly about general public comment. Th those are the kind of items, if you cut that out of it, you will have a streamlined meeting. And what I mean by that is, first of all, talk less, listen more. Second of all, do some prep before you come in here. You, you don't know that that is strictly for the 30 minutes of general public comment. I mean, you cut that question out, you cut five questions out from each one of you, and boom, we got a streamlined meeting. You, you guys go till 11 o'clock and beyond every single week. And it's not because me and my friends are here speaking. It's not because me and the community are here speaking. It's because you guys talk so much. You talk to hear your voices. You have no self-awareness whatsoever. So I say, you know, do us all a favor, man. Talk, talk a little bit less. And like I said early, said earlier, let's propose a cap on you guys. I think we could have a way more efficient meeting. You would get a lot more stuff done if you guys had 30 minutes on each item instead of 45 minutes, hour, hour 15, hour and a half. You guys are still going back and forth. I mean, listening to you guys last week talk about this item last week, you guys just went around in circles. You guys this and you guys that. You're on 20 minutes here, 30 minutes here. It's like, oh my God, nobody wants to listen to that stuff. Just get to the point. And so then you want to try and blame us. But really, it's just about shutting us down. Because like I, I came in, like I said, I came in here early. This is my second time speaking. I left. I came back. And so I said, you know, I said, you'd be a lot more efficient if you guys would just, you know, you, you cap it yourself to, to 30 minutes. And here's one more suggestion. You guys, that you didn't kick, kick around about. You, you guys ever thought about doing a Saturday meeting? You guys could start at 9 a.m. You could go till 5. Then we could all come in here and speak. You guys work one day a week and you act like it's the it's the biggest thing in the world for you guys to do uh there, there are other solutions to this other than shutting us down where your op where your opposition you want to shut us down that's what this is all about I'm Amy Buffman, a Lawrence resident for basically my whole life. I'd just like to say regarding your 30-minute time limit for public speaking is utterly ridiculous. You would rather silence us from you or anyone else from hearing what we have to say face-to-face -face and publicly than make your time be more efficiently managed throughout the meeting. I know it can't be easy to sit up there and listen to us sometimes, but we have valid complaints about the way our tax dollars are being handled and the other decisions you guys make all around. Sometimes you don't listen to us. In fact, I think mostly you don't listen to us. Even so, it is helpful for a person who is getting screwed by taxes and their government at every turn to be able to express how they feel and say what they expect and in fact hope for. Um, and I wanted to just add in, since this meeting started, 13 people at least spoke during public comments. If you passed the 30-minute limit, you wouldn't have heard what four of them had to say, since some people did go over in their time. And then during one of your agenda items, um, you said, you know, you would have to wait and hear the public comments. And you might not be able to hear that then. Um, thank you, and I hope you won't take this drastic step tonight when you vote. We are here, and we deserve to be heard by our government always. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Winemaster. Um, I, I believe that the 30-minute cap is not warranted. I don't think that people have a venue to speak out when their concerns and the taxpayers 
have really taken it hard this year, and it continues, and it's very frightening to live here. Um, this is the only chance that constituents in this community have to speak out. And I know um, they've said that we can write correspondence. And uh, on the 6th of September, I sent out correspondence that I sent out a few years back um, regarding Queens Road. And I sent 20 questions. And the response I got back, and thank you, uh, Vice Chair Larson, for immediately contacting me back. You were the only one left over in this crowd um, from that time. Anyway, I got back. Uh, thank you for your email and your engagement through the prior discussions about Queen, Queens Road's project. In your email, you pose a number of technical legal questions which would pose a conflict of interest for our city attorneys to answer. I don't even know what that is trying to say. They can't answer me, and I'm going to get paid. I don't know how much I'm going to pay. It's probably a lot more than they told me. It was $4,500 atop of my taxes. Um, and it says, as you know, the city litigated this matter. Should you have legal questions, we would suggest you wish to consult your own legal counsel to assist you in those answers. What would my attorney know about Queens Road? This is city business. And they're, they're just passing the buck. I don't even know where they're going with this. Um, we can show that Queens is a classified as a minor arterial. And I asked that question. A minor arterial is similar to the collector that connects to a principal arterial. In this case, Walker Roos and 6th Street will provide connections to neighborhoods. Anyway, my questions were like, um, what duties does a commissioner owe to the property owner? Who will be responsible for lowering the lowering of my property value because of a third special assessment? How can you justify charging me more than zero since there will be zero benefits to me? Um, let's see. What are some other the good ones that I asked? Anyway, my questions were not legal in any matter. Um, I have just dug through and tried to find things out. And I think there's just been some policies made to cover up the the policies that were in place for all this and i that's my concern you shut down the only venue we have to come out and express um our concerns and then you want to shut that down and that's the kind of explanation i get back which explained nothing thank you hello i'm nicole I'd just add that I don't think there's any coincidence that you all are pursuing this type of censorship at a time when people are struggling the most, um, but much of that is because of decisions you've made. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that the county is pursuing censoring at the exact same time that you are. Um, you've wasted a lot of time discussing this item just to find out that typically we don't go over 30 minutes anyway. Again. You guys are the ones wasting time. We're not taking up your time. You're just scared that more people will start showing up and you don't want to hear that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Chris Flowers, um, consent agenda. Um, last week, Commissioner Larson seemed to be against removing the public's ability to remove stuff from the consent agenda. And the mayor seemed to show has some hesitation about some of this stuff, just in general on this um, item. So I was just going to say, if, if two of you are, um, if neither, or if two of you are not in favor of removing the public's ability, um, to remove stuff from the consent agenda, then I urge you both to stand your ground tonight. Can the commission change something without a majority, without sellers here? Um, two, two is not going to pass, I don't think. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm just saying, if two of you are against uh, removing the public's ability to remove stuff from consent, just hold your ground and make make the other two join sellers at a later date to like um bring it up sometime in the future um and also if stuff on the consent agenda is trivial then why did you have a discussion with mr boyle earlier and not just take take a vote after his three minutes um 
Also, I don't remember y'all discussing about removing public comment from um, the video part of our meetings. And I was just hoping if you all could have a discussion about that tonight. Um, also, I'd like to say if two of you don't want um, public comment removed from the video part, stand your ground. Um, I, 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 doesn't it take three to, to actually change? So just just remember, it's, you just need two to not change something tonight. Um, let's see, also, I'm, I'm okay with setting a 30 minute time, time limit period for um, public comment and, letting, and having people sign up. Um, I, I'd prefer you do set the, like a set time that it's gonna be 30 minutes. So that way, if the public doesn't wanna sit through public comment, they know when to show up. I mean, this seems more aimed at benefiting uh, the the city staff than it does the public on that that aspect. Um, also, why was not, why was going back to four meetings a month not discussed? I mean, that's that, that would make it so we don't have, I mean, you're cramming four meetings into three, that's gonna make things run long. Um, and finally, I want to ask, um, why did the commission direct staff to do this at the August 9th meeting after an executive session instead of during commission items? Um, are we to assume that staff direction on this was related to that executive session? I, I am hoping you can maybe discuss how this all came about because it's not on the video. It's only in the minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Is there anyone online who wants to give public comment on this item? Stephen Watts. <clears throat> with the action, well, with this action proposed, you clearly attempt to limit the ability of the public to use the sole method of direct public contact with the town's elected officials to publicly seek redress, as well as to publicly remind these elected officials of matters trying to be forgotten and buried. An example of this fact is the necessity to observe and ask about the very real reality. Three of the sitting commissioners have participated in a cover-up and complicity in running the first black police chief out of town. And the two newly elected commissioners seemingly are either happy to be ignorant like the rest of us or have been clued in and are not talking. And the public is supposed to trust the police and talk to them? The ability to publicly bring up pressing issues like the many problems within the town police department, that along with the efforts to hide the public injury of allowing the cyber lynching of this first black police chief and hire someone acceptable to the fraternal order of police. That's different than the union workers. It's another possible internal terrorist cabal, which isn't limited to mere rank and file union members. How does a town police department, the small size of Lawrence, Kansas, have so many problem behaviors from staff, internal problem behaviors and public problem behaviors? Certainly the provisions and promotion of warrior training for so-called peace officers might suggest where leaders' heads are at, but we don't talk about it. I get it. So it's a reason to restrict because the rule is we don't talk about it. You know, quoting a real U.S. Supreme Court justice, when America was America, before the time, Justice Louis Brandeis, freedom to think as you will and speak as you think are means indispensable to the discover and spread of political truth. The remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. The issue of taking things out of the consent agenda by the public needs to be retained. Thanks. Jeremy Roth-Cushell. Thank you, Jeremy Roth-Cushell, Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, I, I believe it, it looks like this body is actually engaged in delegitimizing itself and its own functions, which are very important in terms of the discretion 
and the will that it was given by we the people. The, it, if it is as it has not been denied the issue that uh, Chris Flowers has brought up about the apparent executive session August 9th origin meeting of this, if that if it has not been denied, then I'm going to go with the fact that, that that is where this all came from. That might suggest that this entire process, this entire uh, alleged proposal of shutting down the public deliberative democratic function, which is, we're, remember, we're, we're the people who started the government. We the people, also we the press. Where is this meeting going to be covered? You still haven't covered YouTube. Do we, are we going to have a total and complete record as, as the city is already under the guidance of quote unquote city legal shrunk down the actual content of public input via the minutes. Now, if we go back to the executive session on August 9th, it appears to be a tautological exercise that potentially violates the open meetings uh, standards in our state of Kansas. Because as far as I can see, all that the motion that was made and uh, Commissioner Finkeldy made the motion based on the action that was on the agenda was that the commission was going to recess into executive session regarding current law and policy pursuant to KSA 754319B2. The justification for the executive session is to keep attorney-client privilege matters confidential at this time. There is absolutely no subject matter. And, and what I've seen from Max Couch, our local uh, open meetings and open records uh, act for, and First Amendment uh, expert, he, he points out that, that in uh, 2018, Kansas Attorney General opinion says that the, a public body or agency must do more than provide a generic or vague summary or a list of the subjects to be discussed. However, the coma does not require that the statement describing what will be discussed to be so detailed that it negates the usefulness. So we heard absolutely nothing about the subject matter of the executive session other than that it was self-referential around how executive uh, sessions can be made and that there was some kind of uh, uh, confidential legal matter. Now, was that legal matter having to do with how much you could shut down public input? We need to have a, a, a total and complete public record. It cannot be on YouTube and you cannot, you, I need you to talk about what Time. you're gonna do with YouTube. And if you're gonna shut down YouTube, all you're gonna do is cause more transparency by we the people journalists who will not allow the people's voice to be silenced. Don't trust City Thank Legal you. at this point. Thank you. Anyone else online? Nobody else online, Shay? Oh, I'm sorry, no okay. mayor. No one? No. Okay, thank you. Let's bring it back to the commission. Well, I like the idea of bringing it to the, to the first item on the agenda, the general public comment I'm talking about. But I do wonder the value <clears throat> of putting a time limit on it if what we're seeing is that the on average, the time limits really don't exceed that 30 minutes. Because I thought the re one of the reasons was to put the 30 minute time limit on it so we know that we would start the regular agenda or consent agenda at 6.15. And what staff, what I'm hearing staff say is that they don't wanna put um, start times or end times, uh, dedicated end times to, to the agenda. So I'm wondering about the value of, of limiting it to 30 minutes if that's not an, doesn't appear to be an issue um, on that. And I'm also still, con still concerned about not allowing the public to comment on parts of the consent agenda. Because again, I go just thinking back that um, although items are pulled off the agenda, I'm not sure if that's where our where time would be gained to any significant degree. Um, 
then how did you feel about the two different consent agendas? I mean, the two separate agendas. I, I mean, that's fine. But again, I just don't like the idea of not allowing the public to comment on any aspect of the consent agenda. I'm concerned about that. I've been one in favor of that, but I do think that if if you said that, as I thought more about the way we're talking about structuring this, if you had something you want to talk about consent agenda and you weren't allowed to, you'd come to public comment and make comments on the consent agenda because that's something that you can talk about on the regular agenda. So we might end up not saving ourselves any time if they were commenting anyway, well, which you know, what my point is. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? But if we, if the public's not allowed to comment on something that's not on the agenda during public comment, is that? Well, I mean, I guess that's the question. If we said, you know, consent item one is, you know, paying for a bridge, and we said paying for the bridge can't be commented on, you, you know, a, an item, member of the public can't pull that from consent, it would seem like they'd be able to talk about it and, in public comment, which then would defeat the purpose of yeah, that's that. So I think it's, I mean, I can see where the idea is not um, workable in the idea of trying to streamline the meeting. I mean, I'm, um, you know, my concern is just uh, more, of, more of a concern, with just the general decorum, um, trying to maintain that and civility. Um, and that's where I would be coming to give the 30 minutes or the not allowing discussion on the consents. Cause uh, you know, I, th you know, I agree that, you know, we need to give the opportunity for our community members to come and speak to us. And that doesn't seem to be an area where we're losing a lot of time from what I'm hearing from staff. Since 2019. Since 2019. Is that what, what Which, you Was that what you said, Sherry? Your study was from 2019? Uh, we went from 2019 to current, and I, I wouldn't say that that's not where we're using time. We actually, on average, spend more time on consent than general public comment. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. again, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't like the idea of saying somebody can't comment on an item on the agenda. I struggle with that. Commissioner Littlejohn? <clears throat> Um, okay. Uh, I'm just listening to see exactly how this works out. Um, because I don't know, I just, <laughs> we've consistently had meetings that go past 12 or not 12, but 11. Um, we've consistently, you know, not been able to finish things on our agenda. Um, which put, gets pushed back to the following agenda. Um, so I'm all for everybody in the community having you know, a chance to speak. That's great. I just, uh, I don't know. It's, I, I'm hoping that we can find the balance of actually getting things done for the city as well. Any comment on the decorum language that has been recommended by staff? I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Commissioner Littlejohn, are you fine with that? Fine with that. I am. I am concerned. So switching back to the the as we've talked and had lots of discussion about, and we're still thinking about, certainly I am, about how we do our minutes. And right now we, you know, the only way public comments show up in there is through our recording. So I definitely believe our live public comment needs to be somehow, you know, recorded if it's not gonna be otherwise recorded in the minutes. So. Because um, that's the way we, you know, that's the way we monitor things now. 
So I'm, yeah, I'm concerned so, about that. Commissioner Finkel, I know that provided, or they have an audio recording of the county's minutes during public comment, um, or the county's public comment. Um, could we potentially just do that ourselves on our end, not necessarily provide video, just provide audio? Is that something that would appease you? I'm not, I mean, if we're going to use our video as a, you know, as our minutes, as a, you know, an accurate reflection of what occurred in the meetings, then I'm not sure why you turn the video off. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, hmm. I could imagine doing that, just creating some more work for staff. Yeah. Um, so are, are you saying that we you don't want it to be recorded or, no, or want, the other? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying keep it the way it is, I guess, because the way it, I mean, under the new proposed resolution, we would. Um, I'm trying to find the language here. That we would not include the general public comment in our in our stream, in our rebroadcast. And I guess, you know, we don't have any other record of that. Right, so there wouldn't be a public record of the of the public comment. And that's not that's not good. Yeah. That's why I propose is providing the audio. I mean, I me mean, you wouldn't get the video, but you'd still get the content of what they say. But, but that would, again, just create work for staff to do something different. I, guess, I don't see the advantage of that. Anything else on here that we haven't addressed? What's your thought on the consent then? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of backtracking, but I want to see where, where you're at on consent or, or well, thoughts on I, consent. I, I could have been talked into separate consents. Um, I will say, I mean, having come to these meetings for many years before this, um, I've pulled all kinds of things. Um, and sometimes at the last minute, because you just didn't notice it or didn't think anything of it till the last minute. Now, I do like the idea of signing up for general public comment. Why is that? Um, I think it would give us an idea as to what we might be looking at. Um, and and I think, yeah, that w what we might be looking at as far as time, potential time. Um, so if you, if you don't have a, if you don't have a time limit, mm -hmm. Um, it may not make a difference. Yeah, yeah, it may not make a difference. Yeah. I guess in theory, if 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 you don't have a time limit and you knew 15 people signed up and you were first on the agenda, you could say, well, I'm not going to show up for 45 minutes because there's going to be 15 people speaking before I get there. I mean, I guess it could have some info, informational value to have a sign up in advance. But... I also, you know, sometimes, like you said, you don't <laughs> know until the last minute that you want to speak yeah, on something. Is that just another way some folks might believe that that's another way to kind of discourage? Discourage folks discourage from showing up. And I don't want to do that. Yeah. So, sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of this has sounded good in short streaming just, meetings, you know. maybe. Justin's probably right. We so should. You, just, it's us that we talk too much. But. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you don't care about the sign up? 
Yeah, I, I think that it could be used as a tool against public engagement. Yeah. Yeah, I was never able to sign up for it. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whoever's going to come is going to come. So I'm in favor of bringing it to the very start of the meeting. I'm definitely in favor of that. And the decorum language. And the decorum language, I'm fine with that. Sherry, does that? Um, so there were some items that had been that were on the draft last week that I didn't specifically discuss because there was a conversation and I thought there was um, some level of um, agreement from a majority that you wanted to leave those items. So I just want to make sure on what we have in here that you want removed. So um, decorum language that we updated, go ahead and leave that. Um, there had been last week, um, it seemed I um, some level of agreement on um, the section we added. And I don't know if Porter, you can share that or I could get back up there. The resolution, um, we said um, that public comment should be limited to issues and items germane to the business of the governing body. That was in the draft resolution and there was no comment about removing that. So I just want to make sure we're clear that's okay to leave in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then on consent agenda, the language that was pr proposed last week that we left in, um, says if the city prepares an agenda, then the city may identify a portion of the agenda's consent. And that um, essentially it just adds language that says that we may identify items on the consent agenda as not being subject to public discussion. It sounds like we want that language taken out. Right. Okay. Um, and then um, the live streaming. Um, so no sign up in advance. That was another change for general public comment. Remove that. Um, live streaming and rebroadcast. Remove that section that says we won't be including that in the live stream. And then on time limits for the um, general public comment, we are going to include the 30 minute cap or we are not going to have a 30 minute cap. Not. Okay not okay um so essentially decorum language and um the germ the language about it needs to be germane to the business of the governing body and the moving to the top of the agenda that's and not actually in the resolution the agenda. yep and that's the only yeah. change to yeah, the right. order of the agenda so that it's okay and that's not in here but we'll we'll do that okay um and if Randy is on, I just want to ask if we need to bring this back or if you can, I mean, I feel like that's quite a few changes. So we are going to need this back or if he's okay with adopting it with those changes. <laughs> this is Randy Larkin, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, that's up to the, that's at the discretion of the commission. They can direct us to have it adopted that way or we could bring it back to them on consent and they can approve it. Um, but basically that's their discretion. I'd say bring it back on consent. And if it needs to be pulled, we can, somebody can pull it. Especially with Commissioner Sellers not here, she might, right. mm -hmm. she might have something she wants to say. Very good, thank you, Randy. We'll get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. That brings us to commission items. I do have one item. I would like to know if any commissioners are interested in um, having staff reevaluate the parklet to potentially look at some of those areas that. Yes, thank you for there. bringing it up. <laughs> I'm interested in it. So yeah. I, my hope is that it, it won't be as onerous on staff considering most of it require anything that might require a, a fire chief's advice since they're all, they're all on brick, if I understand correctly. And I don't see any reason they should be charged any differently than so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly interested in that and interested in making sure it's, you know, that we do that in a, in a way that, I know I think we've sent them notices that, you know, they have to stop here soon. And yeah. um, in some ways, those are much less controversial. And I think so. And mm -hmm. so I understand why the staff did what they did. I understand we talked about it. Um, yeah. 
you know, and understand that we didn't direct the staff to do otherwise. Um, but staff I guess we're, we're directing the staff now. <laughs> yeah, staff can always bring back the reason it needs as to why or why not. And so I know they've come up with some, and I'm perfectly willing to listen to those and hear what they've got to say. Okay. I would agree. I'm all for it. Uh, and so just so I understand, so you're you're wanting to revisit the policy or just get uh, kind of an update on implementation of the policy? So the issue brought up by a couple commenters earlier about the amenity area. So the, the area is mid block and at exactly. the end, that's the only thing we want to. Yes, <laughs> we don't want to uh, open the whole thing back up again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but specifically the ways those are different than the parklets. Okay. And some discussion uh, potentially yeah. leading to mm -hmm. um, some revisions to that piece of the yeah. policy. Gotcha. Understood. Yeah. And so how quickly are you wanting that back? Because we have notified those individuals right. that they, under the current code, they've been um, notified to remove them. Right. When does it end? When does uh, they have to change over or do whatever? They were supposed to have them removed by the 2nd of September. Oh. Okay. Well, I'd be, I mean, I'd be interested in, I guess, you know, maybe even a two-part process. One would be an interim process. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are public spaces that people can, can use. I mean, is there a way to um, be flexible on, you know, allowing them to be used while we walk through the process like we did before? Um, I'm interested in that. Um, you know, I think it's also possible that... I mean, it is related to the parklet, but it's not necessarily related to the parklet. And I understand that's one of the reasons we didn't include it in there. And so maybe it's a different policy altogether. I don't know what, you know, exactly where that goes. Um, but uh, I guess I'm I'm interested in a short-term solution and a long-term solution. And I don't want to put the staff under pressure to come up with the be-all, end-all too quickly. Um, but on the other hand, at least I'm interested in, in seeing some of those uses still allowed. Yeah, just an extension of current, or I guess it's not current, the old um, mm -hmm. The temporary yeah. use. Yeah. yeah. Temporary use until something final is decided. It makes sense. I, th I think we can respond to that. Um, we'll, we'll want to probably put that on the first meeting uh, of yeah. next month. Mm -hmm. um, and come with some alternatives, both for interim and potential long-term. Yeah. And Mayor, I did see Randy, um, I don't know if Sorry, had something that. to add. Well, this is Randy Larkin, Deputy City Attorney. We could bring something similar to what we did when we temporarily suspended uh, various uh, code provisions to allow the parklet program during the COVID, uh, during an interim period as we go through and analyze these uh, amenity areas. If that Thank was the you. commission's <laughs> wish. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's. Randy, thank you. Great. Excellent. I, Anything else? I have another one. It's it's been so long since we've had time for commission items <laughs> that we haven't. Um, I had a couple that are now like so old I won't even say them. I was building the <laughs> list, but I, I'll pass on. One thing of note, and then one request, I think. One is, you know, we did have on the city manager's report actually a while, a couple of weeks ago, the updated lot inventory. Yeah, we did. And our lot inventory, we projected we had a 5.8 years of inventory last time, and now it's 3.2 years. Mm -hmm. So um, our prediction wasn't very good that we went from, I mean, in theory, we'd go from 5.8 to 4.8, but we went from 5.8 to 3.2. Um, and so that's a pretty dramatic drop in one year. Um, and so anyway, I note that and I just, we didn't get to talk about it at the time. Is um, Jeff still with us if we want to ask him? No, he's not here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Never mind. He's out of town. But I guess the one thing I would like to, to talk about and maybe provide direction or ask staff to come back with is, you know, that, now that we're done with the budget, um, I think we budget and we know how much of the ALPA money we have left, I guess I would like to ask staff to come up back with a recommendation of, of how we're going to use that ALPA money. Um, we've kind of set aside some in the 2023 and, and possibly the 2024 budget, but we still have some left over. 
personally, I like to see it used to accelerate, well, on to some affordable housing projects, in particular, the projects that the county has already um, funded, and I think we could accelerate. I mean, for a couple examples, you know, they, they, they gave Habitat for Humanity $850,000 to buy land, but Habitat doesn't have, and you can build 50 affordable units, but they don't have the money to build the 50 affordable units. So it'll be years before they build it all. Right. That would be an example of something where if we put some money towards it, they could accelerate those because we do need those units. And we hear more about homelessness and we hear about, you know, getting to those 400 units. Um, I, I think we need to move that forward and the longer we wait, um, so anyway, I, I guess I'm just saying let's hear staff's recommendation, or let's let's move that forward towards towards that use or any other use that they might suggest. But let's get to on onto that topic. I agree. I think that's good. One thing I would like to add to that, as far as po looking at possible projects, is whether or not a portion of that money could be used to advance um, completion of the Lawrence Loop, um, any area of the Lawrence Loop, at least part of it, not. But I'm definitely want to see the majority of the money go into a housing situation. Walter Courtney, we need one more to give three. <laughs> yep, I would also like to see that as well. So, all right. Did that give you everything you needed? Okay. That brings us to the city manager's report. Uh, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, the City Manager's report is um, on the agenda. If you have any questions, I'm happy to respond, but it is pretty brief this week. Any questions? Nope. Public comment? Any public comment online? No, Mayor. Great. Um, that brings us to the calendar. Another thing we haven't looked at in a long time. Anything to add? Okay, great. All right, entertain a motion. Move to adjourn. Adjourn. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 House is four to zero. Thank you, everybody. See you about.